If everyone could please take their seats, we'll be getting started prompted at the top of the hour. If you could please take your seats, we'll be getting started in one minute. Data from randomized clinical trials is used to evaluate the safety and efficacy of new therapeutics to bring new therapies to market. Advances in technology have enabled the use of a new type of data, real-world data, RWD, which is routinely collected during clinical care and captured in a variety of sources like electronic health records or claims data. Real-world data can complement clinical trials to provide an assessment of treatment effectiveness in everyday clinical practice and in broader and more diverse patient populations than are often included in traditional clinical trials. Real-world evidence derived from real-world data can provide clinical evidence about the use and potential benefits or risks of therapeutics and support regulatory decision-making. Real-world evidence can potentially support expanding a therapy's label to include a new population. Often, RWD can be challenging to aggregate and analyze due to differences in data sources, variability in data quality, inconsistent definitions, and missing data. To move this exciting field forward, Friends of Cancer Research formed a multi-stakeholder collaboration that identified clinically meaningful real-world endpoints and developed best practices for drug development and regulatory decision-making. Our collaborative pilot projects on real-world data helped establish aligned definitions and protocols for capturing real-world endpoints, such as time to next treatment, and evaluated the consistency of these endpoints across data sets from different data sources. The RW Response Pilot Project expands on these initial findings and establishes methods for measuring tumor response to treatment in real-world data. Generating robust real-world evidence will modernize how we understand and develop treatments for patients. Friends of Cancer Research is continuing this work to help yield consistent information and provide important insights into clinical outcomes in patients with cancer. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today uh, for our public meeting on real-world evidence, supporting the use of real-world data in oncology drug development. We're really pleased to have all of you joining us here in the room today, as well as many people joining us also online. Today's meeting uh, will bring together experts to discuss opportunities for the use of real-world data in oncology drug development. 
As many of you know, there's been recent FDA guidance and legislation that have highlighted the possibility of using real-world data and real-world evidence to support drug development. However, alignment on strategies and methodologies for analyzing this data is still needed. Today's meeting, as you heard in the video, will focus on uh, and build upon our multi-year portfolio of projects using real-world data, and we'll be presenting new results from the most recent real-world evidence pilot, which focuses on consistencies of measure across multiple different data sources. We hope that today, all of the sessions will be interactive. We encourage your participation, your questions uh, at, during the panel discussions. For those of you that are here in person, you'll notice that as our panelists are on the stage, there will be uh, microphones within the aisles for you to uh, raise your questions uh, for them to be able to answer. When the moderators call on you, please introduce yourself briefly with your name and your organization. And for those of you that are participating online, please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll work to incorporate as many questions as possible into the discussions today. Uh, please also feel free to follow along on social media, on Twitter by using the hashtag uh, Real World Evidence and Friends and in our, in our following our Twitter handle, at Cancer Research. Uh, the slides, last thing, will be available after the meeting, so uh, you'll be able to find those circulated in your email or on our website as well. So let's go ahead and uh, get started, please. I'm really excited to kick off today's meeting with a keynote conversation moderated by Steve Usden at BioCentury with Amy Abernathy, the President of Product Development and Chief Medical Officer at Verily. Please go ahead and take your seats in the hot seat. Uh, as the editor, of, as the Washington editor, uh, Steve has led BioCentury to become a key news source for many aspects of healthcare and pressing topics related to health policy. Amy has been critical to this real-world evidence uh, work and, in fact, making it possible from the beginning. I think it was a few years ago we were at a, uh, an unrelated meeting and had the chance during a lunch break to sneak away to a Starbucks over in Chinatown where we started kicking around the idea about how we might be able to collaborate with the broader community and begin to pressure test various endpoints uh, that may be easier to extract from electronic health data given the challenges posed by some measures typically collected in a more controlled clinical trial setting. The goal as we started thinking about that was to use specific pilots to delineate opportunities and limitations to the use of real world evidence and better understand the potential variability that may exist between different data sources, maybe even ways to alleviate it where appropriate. It was just a rough concept then, but, uh, and we didn't really know who we might be able to bring together for these unique partnerships. But now, after numerous projects and promising findings, I'll start the day by simply saying thank you to all of our project partners who have helped along the way and helped shape these initiatives, which we're pleased to present the third uh, later today. We'll hear from many of them throughout the, the conference this, this afternoon. Uh, but first, I'm very pleased to turn things over to Steve and to Amy to get us started and set the stage on how far we've come and perhaps where we need to head to further leverage healthcare data from clinical practice as a tool for research. So thank you, guys. <clears throat> well, uh, thanks, Jeff. Is this working? Yeah. Yep. Great. So, so, so Amy, you, you know, your whole career has been really focused on this idea of creating a learning healthcare system and figuring out how to um, how to learn from the experience of every patient and how every patient can benefit from that kind of an interactive. Uh, feedback and how um, how to create perspective systems for doing that. And I, I've been interviewing you for more than a decade and kind of asking you this the same question over and over again. And I feel like the kid who's in the back seat of the car who says, you know, are we there yet? So I, I know we're not there yet, but we're somewhere, right? So, so um, where are we? Well, so first of all, thank you. And thank you to the entire Friends of Cancer Research community. Um, this is a remarkable conversation today because we have been on the journey together. Um, you know, I, I think back to 2009 when we first started talking about how to bring learning healthcare to cancer and this idea that the patient sitting in front of me, her care is informed by all people who came before her with some similar um, characteristics and disease and life and her care would then also be um, reinvested into the future of other patients' lives and their care really as part of her legacy. And, and that has been the story of building a learning healthcare system we've had all along. And 
in 2009, when we started talking about it in the context of cancer, we said, you know, oncology is the obvious place to do this work. Highly patient-centric, motivated patients and clinicians looking for something to make a difference in this person's life. Um, the need for novel treatments and uh, technologies, and ultimately, this idea of understanding clinical trials and data. So. Now, as we started along, those, along that way, we really identified the need to leverage data that already existed, whether those were in formalized registries, like were being collected all over the country and all over the world, or in sources like the electronic health record and claims, to be put to work in service of um, that learning healthcare system model. And in fact, I think we've come a long way starting to figure out what data sources we can leverage, how to curate them, use cases from study design and um, patient finding for clinical trials to starting to understand, for example, natural history and even starting to simulate real world control um, arms and asking questions about what endpoints could we derive from many of these data sources. So I, I think over this journey, we've started to see some of these aspects come into play, but we have a long way to go. So, so that is a good segue to the next question, which is where are we going? What, needs to, what are the hurdles that need to be overcome? to get to where we're going, I, and I think that part of that is, are, are we kind of at an inflection point where we're either have or are close to getting about as far as we can with leveraging existing data sources like electronic health records, and where we need to go um, in, in a direction of um, more um, proactively generating new sorts of uh, new data sets or figuring out new ways to link um, diverse kinds of data sets um, to, to advance the mission. So where are we going? If, if I think about this, I put, put mm, this into a few different categories. Uh, the first is that we still have work to do in getting smarter about leveraging what I'm going to call passively collected data. So electronic health records, claims data, environmental data. Um, and, and that really is a scientific conversation and the scientific methodological work as much as it is any, anything to be able to continue to understand what can we reliably collect from those records, how do we curate it. I do think, though, that it's time to also advance our thinking from real-world data is only passively collected data to real-world data as also data that exists in the system that when appropriate, we can use in service of our evidence generation tasks, and how do we partner that with intentionally prospectively collected information, either to specifically fill in data gaps, or to collect what I call ephem ephemeral data, like patient reported outcomes data, that if you don't collect it prospectively at the moment in time, it goes away, and also pair that with other important and rich data sources. So prospective, I think, becomes a key part of the real-world data story in the future. Another key part of the real-world data story, I think, in the future is transparency, right? Making sure that individual patients, people, citizens, understand how their data are being used and have the opportunity to participate in, in, in prospective and proactive ways. And then the, another aspect that I think is going to become more and more of our real-world data, real-world evidence conversation is multimodal data. Not just EHR and claims data, or even just molecular genomics data, but sensor data from a watch, patient-reported outcomes data from interacting directly with people, environmental data, multi-omics data, and being able to put all of those different sources together in longitudinal context that tells the story of a person's life through a 360 degree view of data. So that really raises questions, I think, of when you're talking about putting, telling a, a, a person's story in 360 degrees of data, it's got exciting possibilities, but it's also got terrifying possibilities, right? <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so I wonder, it seems to me that the, the heart of it, you just talked about transparency, but the heart of it also is gonna have to be reconceptualizing consent. Um, and I know that's something that you've, you've thought about and you're working on. Can you talk about that a bit? So um, as we think about transparency, we saw this in COVID, right? So um, the Im importance of bringing people along with what's going on, the importance of representation, um, but also the Im importance of giving people the opportunity to participate and to knowingly know, be, be a part of the conversation. 
I, I don't know about you. I'm an oncologist, old oncologist in the clinic, and the, the idea of consent for a clinical trials often used to come with a, oh, this is gonna be a three hour conversation with 50 pages, and I, I, get, I got more stuck on the, the duration of, of the task than, than sometimes the importance and the, and the agency in the moment. And, and if we reframe consent as a pretty critical moment in time that does many different things, I, I think it becomes Im important to think about. So, so first of all, this is the moment to partner and give the person agency about what happens with their information and, and, and how you interact with them across time. So there's an important aspect of consent in the new story of real-world data that I think we're gonna see more and more because by definition, prospective data collection is gonna be required in, as we move this real-world evidence story forward and so that's gonna require consent. The second thing I would say about the moment of consent is that there, is a, there are different data quality characteristics when you leverage passively collected data that was existing for some other source versus prospectively collected data. So after that moment of consent, now new things can happen, and so it's really important from a data capture and data quality perspective. Another thing is, as we think about consent, we need to rethink about consent itself from a monolithic process, everything within one document, to it now still may be one set of verbiage, but different components that action certain tasks, like data linkage, so to consent for tokenization and, and data linkage being a, a part of the consent action, or HIPAA as being a part of the consent action. So these can be components that happens at the moment of consent. And the last thing I would say about consent is that it actually acts as a critical step, because you can use that moment now to action data permissioning, as I mentioned, tokenization, but also a moment to action participating and handshaking with a person across time as that interaction spot. So I always tell uh, folks at Verily, as we think about product development and consent, we need to think about consent not as being essentially DocuSign, but actually a step in this process of shaking hands with a person and walking with them across time. It, it sounds like consent isn't even really the right term anymore. It, it, it's, not, it's not just consent, it's, it's really partnering with people. It really, it, you know, I, I haven't ever really thought about it this way, be, because I think we sort of come to this landscape with the language of informed consent from our traditional clinical trials thinking, but it is a different task, really, in this partnership task and taking it forward, while making sure that people are appropriately informed. And, and consent also needs to ma match the complexity and risk of the task. Sometimes it is gonna be that three hour experience that I you know, kind of remember from my oncology days because that's the, that moment in time. And sometimes it's a much lighter weight interaction that is around um, permission to recontact or permission to leverage data that exists in sources like the EHR. And, and, and it sounds like also what you're saying is it's not gonna be necessarily a one time thing. It's gonna be something that people will be interacting with over time, and they may change the way that they they think about the use of their data over time. Oh yes, you know, if, if you think about this, you should have as much of the ability to say, eh, 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 you did not use that information the way I asked you to, or for some reason I want to pull it back, as well as the opportunity to say yes, move forward. And and so I, I think that permissions as a dynamic concept is also what we're going to start to see. Um, GDPR and, 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 and other privacy frameworks have helped to push some of that thinking forward. And the other thing that I would say is, isn't it interesting that we have consent for health systems or healthcare environments and consent for clinical trials and we consider those to be completely separate things. But when you think about it, HIPAA consent or consent for a surgical procedure is not really any different than consent to have your data incorporated in an evidence generation task or a clinical trial, and the same software and capabilities can be leveraged in both of those environments as long as the regulatory requirements and the right kinds uh, of expectations are met, instead of it being two completely different concepts. And one way to ultimately start to give patients more agency is to bring the way we think about the distinction between research and care, bridge that and bring them more closely approximated. So w w one of the other things I'm thinking about, and also must be really top of mind for you at Verily, is that if you're talking about prospective 
collection of data, and you're talking about getting data from people's phones, from wearables, from all kinds of other kinds of sources, the amount of actual amount of data is going to grow exponentially. It's going to be huge, right? So how, how do you think about that, and w how does that affect the task that everybody here has for advancing the use of real-world data um, in oncology? I, I don't know about you, but I mean, every time I think about this, it's mind-boggling. It, it, when we first started working on trying to curate electronic health record data, um, I'm an old melanoma doc, so we started off with melanoma and, and, and lung cancer because the only way we could imagine getting there was taking it in bite-sized chunks, right, and figuring out how would we clean up the electronic health record, and that was just going to be one data type, right? Um, and now is sort of we quickly imagine where this future is going and becoming a reality before our eyes, what you're seeing is longitudinal clinical data, genomic data, sensor data, data that's going to come not just from sensors on, in, in your wrist, but many, many kinds of sensors um, around us in the future, again, with the right privacy and security um, uh, elements in place, and I, I can't uh, say enough about how important that is, but we've got a lot of work to do there. So first of all, we do need to make sure that we're thinking about privacy and security in the most state-of-the-art ways, because as you pointed out, those different data types coming together, it is nearly impossible to um, imagine a world where you can't be fully re-identified if, if, if we don't have um, the, right the, the right expectations and safeguards in the system. The second is that we're going to need to make sure that the technologies are available to us to not only link those data sets and put them together in appropriate and, in my mind, longitudinal context because basically how things happen across time are particularly important as these data sets come together. But we also need essentially the capabilities that allow us to deal with voluminous data. What's different between now and 2009? A lot of those technical capabilities are very different. So our ability to leverage the cloud looks nothing like it, it, it looked like in 2009. Or think about the AI conversations of the last you know, year. Holy cow. Right? So the ability to leverage computation at scale and the cloud and collaborative research environments are, are different are going to be um, required. And I think the other thing that's going to be really important as these many different data sets um, come together is you need to do the deep dive methodological work of learning how to work with the individual data types. So for example, we um, make a product called StudyWatch at Verily, which is a digital sensor, set of digital sensor, sensors on the wrist to collect information about movement and sleep and heart rate and many different other aspects, learning how to build digital biomarkers from those unique data sources at the individual data type. And that deep methodological work, which includes development and validation and continuous performance monitoring, but then also doing the methodological work of what it means to pull multiple data types together and make sense of them, either for multimodal bi uh, biomarkers that pull across many different data types, or essentially um, clinical research that's relying on endpoints coming from many different data sources. Switching gears a little bit, Jeff mentioned at the beginning this kind of um, um, secret meeting that you had at the Starbucks <laughs> sounds like something from a spy novel, you know, to, to get to get um, all of this kicked off. And and I wanted you to talk a little bit about public-private partnerships. You were involved in public-private partnerships when you were at FDA. Now you are at, at Verily. What's their role? How important are they? What what what's been accomplished um, by these kinds of partnerships and by um, the the pilot programs that they enable? So, you know, as I think about that time um, back in that Starbucks, we, we were trying to think through how do we do the hard work of showing what's possible and also showing where, where more, more work is needed. And, and asking the question also, how do you understand, for example, what regulators trust and also what regulators want to see adjusted or more of, right? And so these are some of the questions that, and, and what led to um, this portfolio of work um, that Friends of Cancer Research um, kicked off. And when I was at FDA and we were um, really thinking about how to leverage rural data in service of, of addressing the pandemic, um, one of the things that uh, we stepped back and, and, and not only referenced, but um, did copy-paste, was um, the, the approach um, of the public-private partnership and the work 
um, from uh, the uh, portfolio of real world data and real world evidence projects here at Forensic Cancer Research. Because what we could see is that public-private partnerships provide a critical crucible. In, in that partnership, different, essentially, actors in the system have the opportunity to come together to showcase innovations and capabilities. Government has the opportunity and, 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 and regulators to say, here's what I trust, here's what I need more of, and oftentimes also, aha, I actually didn't know that was coming. Here's what I, as a regulator, am going to need to plan for in this evolving future. And really becomes very important through public-private partnerships for the entire community to learn the how-to and keep the leading edge moving forward. What we saw in COVID-19 and the Evidence Accelerator, as we've seen here at Friends of Cancer Research, is that that moved things forward much more quickly than any one company, academic medical center, government body, et cetera, could do by themselves. And finding ways that we make sure that the PPP model continues, I think, is going to be very important. So one place where I think it, it, it might go, and in any case, it's something I wanted to ask you about, is, um, is the role of real world data, real world evidence in new modalities like gene therapies mm -hmm. and cell therapies where it's going to be necessary to track people for very long periods of time to understand um, the persistence of efficacy, unexpected safety issues, and things like that. How, how do you see um, real world evidence, real world data working to do that and what needs to happen to enable it? So, you know, if, if we think about um, the, the landscape of cell and gene therapies and the um, important uh, expectation of meaningful long-term follow-up with a duration of 15 years, maybe even more. I, I always imagine this is like the siren song for real-world data and real-world evidence, right? Um, oftentimes, uh, cell and gene therapies are in going to be indicated in children or adolescents or people with serious diseases who really don't have um, the <laughs> They're going through parts of life where they can't be a clinical trial subject all day long, right? And thinking about ways that we much more easily follow them for long periods of time. It's going to require us to, again, have partnering models with patients who, re who receive these treatments and be able to follow them with their permission for long periods of time. Really, for us to be very smart about how we leverage data that already exists in the system or the smartest data element from the smartest source and add that to the data to the data set. For example, sensors in a watch to understand sleep is going to be much smarter than asking the patient to report sleep or having the clinician report sleep into the data set. So we're going to need to be really smart about how we leverage data from multiple sources. The cell and gene therapy story is going to force us to get smart about how to combine prospectively, intentionally, clinical trials like data with real-world data sources and deal with the data quality mismatches that are going that do exist across those lines. And also, we're going to have to have distributed capabilities that basically meet patients in their home or wherever they are with them on vacation, while also recognizing that cell and gene therapies are you know, the poster child for needing to be administered at a site or location. And so with s combining distributed or decentralized capabilities with site-based capabilities, it's not an either or story. Um, I also, the, the last thing I would say is, interestingly about cell and gene therapies, it's going to force us in the real world data space to do other things that we haven't thought that much about yet, like combining manufacturing data with the rest of our real world data story. Because optimizing in manufacturing and optimizing in the um, effectiveness, efficacy, and safety side will ultimately likely start to take um, lockstep together. And it'll be interesting to see how these things start to happen. You know, I, ha I have about 10 more things I wanted to ask you, but we've got three minutes, so I'm not going to do it. But I will, I, I, I think that the best way to end this is um, with your thoughts about a call to action. Um, what is it that you think that the community that's in this room, that's watching streaming online, um, should do, needs to do, before the meeting, this meeting next year, before um, in, in, in the next year, um, to propel um, the, the vision that you're talking about forward? 
So I'm going to put it in three categories. So the first is, and the call to action, we need to start updating our thinking of data that exists in the system, passively collected data, and how we're going to start to pair that with prospectively collected data as our fuller portfolio of real-world data sources for real-world evidence in the future. It doesn't mean either one of them is the most appropriate or accurate data set. They're both going to be needed in order to solve these problems in the future. The second thing that I would highlight is it's important for us to do the under-the-covers work, the hard scientific work of learning how to use these data sets and how to get it right. And within that, additionally, um, learning how to build the consent models that are going to work for the future within the context of, of this real, da real data and real-world evidence space. Moving real-world data and real-world evidence forward is as much a scientific and methodological task as it is a test technology task as it is a um, patient handshake task. And the third thing I would say on the policy side, we're here in Washington. So I think we have things that we can do from a policy perspective to continue to move this story forward. So public-private partnerships, we mentioned, and, and I think we need to continue the drumbeat of the importance of public-private partnerships. We can do other things that create demand signals, like FDA and CMS alignment, where ultimately, as FDA, there is a need for post-market studies, safety studies, and CMS has needs for, for example, coverage with evidence development, and we understand that the same data set can be used for both tasks if we structure that appropriately, and we have both of those agencies start to think about how does that show up in their work, and who are the people in those agencies ready to receive and ready to um, essentially give instructions and cues for what that might look like. Continue down, down the path of guidances coming from real world um, from, from FDA and, and, and others about how to do this work well that's informed by what we're doing together. And then finally, again, move forward with those demand signals like cell and gene therapies that, that help to continue um, this pathway. Well, that's a mouthful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and four seconds left. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Steve and Amy, uh, for the discussion to set us off today. You really helped outline the opportunities for the future, and hopefully we'll be able to address a few of those in our coming sessions. Um, so as we transition to our discussion, uh, our first discussion for today's meeting, I'll note that each of our panelists, as I mentioned earlier, is a representative of key organizations that have been participating in our real-world evidence pilot projects over the last couple of years. The results from Pilot 1.0 and 2.0 have been published in leading medical journals, and today we'll be hearing new results from a third pilot project aimed at characterizing and comparing the results of real-world response. So let me go ahead and ask our panelists to slowly walk their way up to the stage as we finalize getting things set up for you. Um, overall response rate is an endpoint that is frequently used in cancer clinical trials. However, it's based on an image assessment at regular interval intervals to evaluate change in the tumor in response to treatments. In real-world clinical practice, that timing may not be as regimented and the results may not be as readily available. So today, we will be comparing results from seven independent data sources to better characterize the use of real-world response as an endpoint extracted from real-world data. Before we start off our panel discussion today, we will first uh, hear from some of those results. So I'm happy to turn things over to uh, my colleague, Brittany McKelvey at Friends of Cancer Research, who will start our first session by presenting some of the project results that she has so expertly been leading over the last several months called Establishing a Framework for Evaluating Real-World Response. How do you like that? We made it right on time. <laughs> Thank you so much while we play musical chairs a little bit here. What are we doing? All right. 
Great. Well, so thank you all so much for the opportunity to share our results assessing real-world response endpoints in patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer across real-world data sets. This work, as Jeff alluded to, is part of our broader real-world evidence portfolio with the goal to develop an established methodology for using real-world data to inform clinical trial designs, evaluate therapies, and support regulatory decision-making. This work has been really an effort over, over five years, first starting with our first pilot, which worked to establish align protocols and definitions for capturing certain real-world endpoints, including real-world overall survival, uh, time to treatment discontinuation, and time to next treatment, and a study focused in non-small cell lung cancer. With these aligned endpoints, we then moved to pilot 2.0 to assess the performance of these to identify the direction and magnitude of treatment effect, looking at patients again in non-small cell lung cancer treated with platinum doublet chemotherapy or immune oncology agents. We then evaluated the internal consistency across real-world data sets by applying a more strict inclusion-exclusion criteria uh, similar to a clinical trial. This led us to our real-world response pilot, which will be the focus of the presentation today. And so why did we look at real-world response? We saw the promise that it has as a clinical outcome to provide valuable details about therapeutic efficacy. Promise as signal-seeking to attribute a real-world outcome to a specific drug intervention. But we also saw the problem, and that is that there's a challenge. There's no consensus definition or approach for being able to measure real-world response. As data are not captured in a consistent or structured way, and unlike in a clinical trial with resist criteria, there's no uniform criterion in the observational setting. And so therefore, we established this unique research partnership to develop an aligned framework to be able to measure real-world response across real-world data sets and to initiate the pilot to assess the feasibility of capturing this measure, as well as to assess the consistency of it across different data sets. We had seven participating data partners that contributed EHR-derived data, contributing 200 patients each summary-level data. These patients, similar to our other pilot projects, were patients that were diagnosed with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, treated with a first-line platinum doublet chemotherapy regimen in the metastatic setting. Our pilot objectives were twofold. Firstly, to understand what data were available in the EHR to be able to measure response, and so assessing the availability and frequency of data components, including images, image reports, and the clinician assessment of response. With this information, then evaluating the consistency of a composite measure of real-world response across these seven real-world data sets in this aligned patient population. Briefly showing here our inclusion and exclusion criteria for the pilot through this consort diagram. Patients, again, similar to our other pilots in the same time frame were metastatic non-small cell lung cancer patients. They had to have at least two separate encounters with the healthcare system, and again, had to be treated with a qualifying platinum doublet chemotherapy regimen in the first line. Importantly, also, patients had to have what was considered complete treatment data, so no greater than 90 days from time of their metastatic diagnosis to their next clinical encounter, and no greater than 120 days from that diagnosis to the start of their first-line therapy. This gave us the possible eligible cohort for the pilot. However, we then had each data vendor uh, randomly sample down to 200 patients, such that each cohort had the same number of patients, and due to the feasibility of the manual curation and abstraction that was necessary uh, to be able to ascertain response to give our analyzable cohort. To briefly share then what the uh, cohorts looked like, where each cohort is a separate column to look through the demographic and clinical characteristics, Showing here a heat map where 0% is in white to dark blue at 100%, showing the proportion of patients within each data category. You can see by the blue color pattern that relatively similar across cohorts were patients for age and gender, as well as race and ethnicity where most patients were white non-Hispanic patients. 
For cohorts that did have the practice site information available, you can see that most patients were treated at non-academic institutions with the three cohorts on the far right, although you can see with A through C cohorts, they did have a higher proportion of patients who were treated at academic institutions. Most patients were diagnosed with metastatic disease with non-squamous cell carcinoma histology and did have a history of smoking. Also, as we were interested in evaluating response, it was important for us to understand specific clinical characteristics that may have an impact on this measure. So understanding the evaluable disease, so understanding metastatic site, as well as other treatment modalities or concomitant therapies that would impact the assessment and attribution of response to the specific drug treatment. Therefore, as you can see, we looked at metastatic site, which varied across different cohorts. Most patients were not treated with a VEGF receptor antagonist as well, although about 15 to 30% of patients were. And we see variability as well in other treatment modality with a proportion of patients being treated with radiation therapy. We did later conduct sensitivity analyses to take into account these factors. So we then first explored our first objective, again, to understand the availability of these different data components, all related to the evaluation of the patient's disease, and again, with the clinician assessment being noted in the clinician notes. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but to walk you through this dot plot here, you're looking at the percentage of patients with a specific data component, with each data set being a different color. You'll also notice for images and image reports, we have the distinction between baseline and post-baseline time frame. This is because as you are making, <coughs> excuse me, an evaluation of response, you need both a baseline, so prior to treatment start, and a post-baseline or during treatment imaging or image report to be able to assess response, so those categorizations are there. As you can see when looking at images, we only had two groups that had a large proportion of patients that had imaging available, uh, and only two groups that had images that would actually be extractable, uh, which to us signaled that we would need to take into account other data components for a measure of response. All but one cohort had image reports available, uh, and there was a median of approximately four image reports uh, per patient for those with image reports available. Um, however, although I'm not showing this analysis, we did, when looking at the modality of imaging, see that it was heterogeneous for patients, which may provide difficulty in being able to assess response through reports. You can see that all groups uh, on the far right there, the majority of patients did have clinician assessments available, and most patients had a median of two clinician assessments. It was also important for us to understand the timing of assessments. And so here in this table, you'll see the median as well as the range across cohorts. Again, uh, you can see for the images and image reports some variability. Looking in the middle column here for the baseline to post-baseline time frame with a pretty wide range of 7.3 or 5 to 18 weeks across cohorts. But as you can observe for the clinician assessment, there's relatively consistency in across cohorts. Looking at the index, so start of treatment to their first assessment, as well as the first to second assessment, both being 7.9 weeks as the median. This was also encouraging, as this was more reflective of what you would see in a clinical trial with a normal six to eight week assessment time frame. Lastly, in understanding the clinician response assessments, it was important to understand where this response assessment was coming from. And so you can see for those cohorts that had this information available, the large majority of assessments were due to imaging. Although you can see for some cohorts, there was a larger proportion of assessments that were due to symptoms or physical exam, which obviously would not be taken into account with a more resist-like measure of response. But due to the consistency and the availability and the timing of clinician response assessments, we move forward with measuring response using this information. So we then aligned on a framework for measuring real-world response derived from the clinician assessment of response. Each data partner then abstracted their response measurement using the clinician notes. 
And here I'm just showing a sample of our SAP uh, potential wording that was in the clinician notes that would signal that a patient did have a response. So taking this information, the punchline here, again, a little bit of a busy slide, but to walk through, as you're looking at a bar graph showing the proportion of patients with a given best overall response, the best overall response categories being on the far right. Those patients who responded are in blue, and those patients are then the numerator to determine the response rate out of the total number of patients. I will also note that you can see in black at the top of the bar, there was about 20% of patients or so across each cohort that did not have a response assessment during the study period. And those patients also had the shortest follow-up time total, but were included in our definition of response rate. So you see, hopefully, that there is relative consistency across cohorts in best overall response and response rate. We had a median of 46.5% for response rate. You may note that this is a little higher than what you would expect in a clinical trial in this patient population. This may be somewhat expected because we know in real world uh, clinicians are not using strict resist criteria for their determination. And we also, when we looked further into the data, we see that we had a higher proportion of patients that were considered partial responders than in clinical trials. And we also had fewer patients that were considered stable disease. So potentially some of these patients are being more optimistically categorized as partial responders, whereas in a clinical trial with that strict 30% criteria, they would be considered to have stable disease. We were also interested in understanding duration of response, and so here showing the median and 95% confidence intervals for responders for their duration. You can know that this is variable across cohorts, which is likely due to the variability in timing and reporting of assessment. We also conducted interval censoring, which also showed the variability in data available to be able to obtain duration of response. Lastly, we wanted to understand the association between responders and those other time to event endpoints that we had previously characterized in our pilots. And so here, we're looking at responders compared to non-responders on the bottom for overall survival, time to next treatment, and time to treatment discontinuation. You can appreciate that there's relative consistency in the medians and directionality for these time to event endpoints for responders versus non-responders. And this gave us increased confidence in the measure uh, of response being able to attribute to clinical outcomes. In conclusion, this collaborative partnership allowed us to be able to assess the availability of these different data components to assess response, as well as to evaluate the consistency of this measure across our different rural data sources. We found that clinician assessments of response were available for most patients across all cohorts with relative consistency in the timing of assessments. Real-world response rate using the clinician assessment was relatively consistent across all real-world data sources with consistent trends in time to event endpoints. This demonstrates the feasibility of a response endpoint based on clinician assessment and suggests that real-world response is clinically relevant and further exploration may inform drug effectiveness evaluation. It also shows the power of aligning on methodology across real-world data sources to generate robust and reliable information. With that, I would like to thank all of our pilot project partners, including those on the slide who contributed data, who worked through our analysis protocol, analysis and interpretation of the data. It was truly a collaborative effort uh, that we're really excited to be able to share with you all today. And with that, I will turn it over to our moderator, Liz Garrett Meyer, who will work with our panel to discuss these data in further detail and their implications. Uh, I'm really excited for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany, for that introduction. So I'm going to start today by introducing um, our panelists. Um, first, I'll introduce myself. I'm Liz Garrett Mayer. I'm from the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I am the vice president of the Center for Research and Analytics, and my background is as a biostatistician. 
Um, we have Amanda Bruno um, on the end over here. Um, Amanda is from Cineos Health, formerly Bayer Pharmaceuticals. She is trained as a health economist and epidemiologist and is senior vice president of real world and late phase research at Cineos Health. Next we have Nick Robert. Uh, Nick is the chief medical officer at Antada and Nick is trained in medical oncology, hematology and pathology. And we have Lawrence Schwartz, the uh, chair of the Department of Radiology from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, and his background is in radiology and cancer imaging. Uh, we have Pallavi uh, Mishra Kalyani from the FDA. Pallavi is deputy director of uh, Division of Biometrics 5 in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research and is trained as a biostatistician. And then next to me, we have Yanina Nunt. I'm going to get your last name wrong, uh, Nat Tanzan from Concert AI. And uh, Yana is the Senior Director of Product Insights and Evidence and is trained as a genetic epidemiologist and biostatistician. So thank you all for being here. We look forward to um, uh, hearing all of your thoughts about the pilot. Uh, so we're going to start out with this moderated um, discussion, and then we will open it up for questions from the audience, both in person and online. So for those online, be thinking of your questions, and you can send them uh, in the chat. OK, so for my first question, I'm going to direct it first to Nick, and then I'm going to ask for um, Amanda and Pallavi to also weigh in. So we heard a really nice presentation from Brittany about this pilot, and she described how we've already done several pilots before this pilot. So. Um, what are your thoughts on why it was valuable to conduct this pilot, given that we've do done several others, um, and why were we focused on a real-world measure of um, response to treatment as compared to some of the other pilots we've done before? Sure, Liz. Uh, so as a uh, clinician who's been involved in clinical trials, uh, we're familiar with using RESIS, uh, but we know that many patients are treated beyond a clinical trial, and we look at that real-world data, and the question has been, how do we measure response? And the different groups have different ways of doing it, and they report on it. But as a clinician who's taking care of patients, and you're looking at real world, you're looking at response from a clinical trial with RESIST, and then you're looking at response uh, from real world evidence, how do you measure those? And it's not quite Macintosh and some other apple, it's a little bit apples and oranges. <laughs> so I think this was a really key study because it demonstrates that there are differences, but that the measurements are still of value. They're just, uh, they're different. So it wasn't a big surprise that if you use a lower criteria for response, a patient shows some diminution of their tumor on a scan, you walk in and you say, you're doing great, you're re responding, uh, but that's not the same as a resist response. So the response rate's been a bit higher, if you thought about it, it was predictable just as the duration of response is a bit shorter because they're not as durable. So now when you see something coming out from the real world evidence base on treatments after maybe post-marketing, you'll, you'll have some evidence that has some value. There's not a, the key was there's not a quantitative difference. There's maybe a, uh, there's not a qualitative difference, more of a quantitative difference. Long answer. Great, thank you. Amanda? Yeah, so from a um, industry perspective, I think this, we've all been thinking about overall survival for a long time in the real world data space, the real world evidence space, moving the conversation to real world response and actually thinking about um, an outcome measure that, that impacts, I think, everyone, you know, across the value chain and industry, um, you know, much more than, than the overall survival endpoint was really important just to elevate the conversation, if nothing else, um, you know, that's happening uh, within, um, within the industry space amongst clinical development colleagues, amongst medical affairs, you know, all the folks that are thinking about this evidence generation framework, um, this work was really important. And then um, all of the, the sort of real world evidence folks and, and epi folks, they're tasked with evaluating fit for use of a lot of data sources across a growing landscape constantly. And it's really difficult work. It's expensive work to do that type of feasibility um, across multiple tumor types and multiple uh, areas um, well and in time for to be relevant to the discussion that's happening inside of the four walls of, of uh, any particular company. And so I think this type of work is really helpful just to elevate and evolve the thinking and, and help everyone move forward uh, much more rapidly because of what we were able to see this unique um, integration and consistency across multiple data sets 
um, that all are a little bit different, um, come from different places, that was remarkable to see and hopefully helps to advance the entire, um, the entire space. Okay, thanks. Kalavi? Sure. Um, <clears throat> Just to add to the comments, I, I completely agree with uh, both Nick and Amanda. But from a regulatory perspective, you know, we're often thinking about how are we going to interpret real-world data when it's presented to us? How can we be sure that what we're seeing is attributable to whatever intervention of interest it is that we want to look at with that data? Overall survival is a wonderful endpoint. I don't think there's any disagreement there. But depending on the stage of treatment, the type of therapy you're looking at, it may be difficult in long-term follow-up to attribute any differences you see to any particular intervention. On the other hand, response rate is a more immediate endpoint. It gives us an understanding of the benefit that the patient is receiving, hopefully in the short term, from a particular intervention. That being said, we have a lot of questions about response rate in real-world data from a regulatory perspective. You know, is it being measured consistently in clinical practice? What are the assessment frequencies like? So when this project came along, uh, I think we, um, in the regulatory space, were very excited because it gives us a really good understanding of what that data actually looks like. It's still apples and oranges <laughs> compared to uh, clinical trial response rates, but we have a better understanding of how this endpoint is measured, and what type of information we may actually be able to glean from it. Great, thank you. I don't know if any of the other uh, panelists want to chime in. Okay, so um, so for my next question, um, I'm gonna uh, I'll go to, to Yana first and then uh, Nick. So the this pilot um, that we um, embarked on was in a very specific setting. We had lots of conversations about the setting. I think we spent a lot of, a lot of time I'm honing in on this, and some people might wonder why did we choose metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, but beyond that, why did we, we pick the platinum doublet chemo setting, recognizing that the standard of care is changing? So why was that chosen, and, and what makes this pilot still relevant, recognizing that this is not necessarily uh, the treatment that many patients are receiving in this space? Yana? So I'll, I guess I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> um, so we did, so um, as we all know, I think uh, Brittany also discussed that you know, this pilot is stands on the shoulders of previous two pilots. In those previous two pilots, we did look at metastatic, advanced, non small cell lung cancer, both, um, you know, patients who were receiving chemo doublet and immunotherapy in combination of both. For this pilot, it was really a methodological, a methodological interest. We wanted to evaluate how response was measured, what data was available versus really understand versus compare treatment groups. We were not comparing treatment groups. And there is definitely complexities with immunotherapy and response immunotherapy that we just didn't want to introduce, right, into already really complex situation. That is why, you know, partly because we already we know this population, we work with this population, but mainly is because it was a methodological um, pilot versus one that's that's trying to evaluate comparison between treatment groups. Yeah, one word: pseudoprogression. Uh, immunotherapy is associated with changes in the scan which are difficult to interpret. We have an expert who can tell us how difficult it is and we didn't and it wasn't we weren't interested to see whether the treatment works. We know it works. We were interested in looking at a new treatment because it how do we dissect out pseudo progression? So why don't we do a simple experiment? Can we measure response among these different groups? Is it consistent or not? That was the question and we got an answer. So I think we tr we erred on the side of simplicity. Any other comments? Okay, so um, so uh, Larry, I'll go to you for my to start my next question. So the pilot used clinician-based uh, response assessment. It's very different than the radiological uh, response assessment that we use with RESIS criteria in clinical trials. So what value does this more subjective assessment have uh, for generating real-world evidence than than the traditional RESIS criteria that we're used to in clinical trials? So like, like we've heard, it has quite a bit of value in that the, um, that the clinician is actually, you know, kind of interpreting the radiology report and interpreting or reinterpreting heterogeneity, which may exist uh, from the different modalities that were used, but probably much greater than that is, you know, how the scans are actually interpreted um, uh, by 
practicing radiologist who frankly may or may not know that the patient is on the clinical trial or not. So I think, you know, as we've heard, apples and oranges, maybe two different brands of apples or, 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 or something like that. Frankly, it probably has a lot to do with the therapeutic effect and the magnitude of the therapeutic, you know, effect that, 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 that would gauge that. But it certainly is um, still valuable information. You know, I was struck, as the radiologist here, I was struck by uh, two bits of data. Uh, one, the very um, little availability of the imaging data, yet the fact that most of the, the decision making was made based on the images. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the question is, you know, that's, that, that disparity kind of, how do we bring that, you know, together? Um, and then the other point is, I, I think to make is, uh, you know, what we heard earlier, um, you know, comment that Amy made, uh, about you know measuring sleep, if you have a wearable, are you going to measure it using the wearable, or are you going to ask the patient? I think you could think about imaging really the same way. Perhaps we should be analyzing the images, you know, on the cloud with AI rather than by reports. Interesting. Nick, you want to? Nick, I think you're, you and Amanda will ask also to comment on this question about the value of subjective assessment. Um, that we have here in the real world evidence space. Yeah, sure, I can go next. Um, so in industry, I think there's a lot of, of uses of this, um, of this type of, of endpoint, and a lot of what we have to do is signal seeking or evaluating, as I mentioned before, the feasibility of certain data sources, um, trying to make sure that we are um, um, evaluating the real world outcomes of our patients you know, after they leave the cl clinical trial space and they're more in a life cycle management phase, and there's many, many things that we have to do, even preparing for clinical trials and making sure that we're designing the trials appropriately and using real-world data throughout, again, throughout that value chain is really, really important. And so the near-term impact or a near-term outcome is so much more important to be able to evaluate for a lot of those types of uses because we are hopefully um, allowing uh, fewer um, biases from additional sort of um, additional characteristics of the patients or additional things that happen to the patients, say, post-progression um, in those longer-term outcomes. And so it does allow us to, to more quickly, which is important from a timing standpoint, but also, um, you know, hopefully in at least a different way or a different light with different, with different biases, different limitations, uh, for sure. Um, evaluate all of our therapies in a different in a different way when we're designing trials and when we're trying to evaluate their effectiveness in the real world and safety. I would just say I wouldn't get too caught up in this uh, physician clin clinical assess response in the sense that most of the time images were used, the reports were used, not maybe the images. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I see a patient and the scan is improved, I usually don't second guess the radiologist. I'm not a radiologist. Uh, and, I, and if the patient is symptomatic, asymptomatic, doing well, I go in and say, you're, you're doing better. Uh, and it, it, there's uncommon, but I may notice on a physical exam, new adenopathy, or there may be some symptoms. A patient's performance status may have dropped, so that would be important to include in assessing. But uh, I think, in, in my mind, there, they're not quite interchangeable, but they're more like different apples as opposed to apples and oranges. It's, uh, it's mostly, if for this setting of metastatic non-small cell cancer, we're using scans to decide on, on the status of response or not. Any, any other comments? I'll make a quick comment. Because uh, we are going back and forth here on our metaphors, on yeah, apples and oranges. We're staying, and staying different fruits, though. We have some, we're, we're all fruits, <laughs> but uh, personally, I do think it's apples and oranges. It's not to take away from the clinical meaningfulness of the oranges of the, <laughs> <laughs> of the uh, clini clinician's assessment of response. It's a different measurement. We're, we're measuring a different endpoint, and that itself is very clinically meaningful, but it's not the same as radiologic-based response. And I think that's important to remember because how this data and these methodologies will be used in the future will be determined by what it is they're actually measuring. Yeah, uh, what we probably should do is see how often the CT scan shows evidence of response and how often the, radi the clinical assessment varies, is mm -hmm. discordant. I suspect there's high concordance. I can't imagine 
seeing a scan that's better and going to a patient and saying you haven't responded. Yeah. But we, 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 I don't think we did do this in this study. So I think you ask. I think you're responding to the last question. Yeah, <laughs> Liz is gonna ask <laughs> some foreshadowing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, so let's move on um, to the findings and the implications of the findings from this pilot. So I'm gonna start with you, Yana, for this next question. So we saw variability in the access and availability of the images in the electronic health rec records across the different data sources. If there were images available, what are the considerations for using images, uh, for the imaging for the real world response assessment? So um, we did find, you know, interestingly enough that and a majority of the decisions, a majority of the assessments were made based on imaging. But we did find that the imaging, uh, so extractable images that could be available to be reviewed by different radiologists or independent radiologists were not available in majority of the data sources. However, even if they were available, even if every um, participant you know, had images available, the issue is that they would still not give us resist because Patients are not measured; they're not scanned in the same cadence as, you know, in a clinical trial. They're not lesions are not followed in the same way. Different modalities are used. So even if we had, let's say, every participant had what everybody would want is an acceptable image read by an independent radiologist, we still wouldn't have been able to get to resist. Um, so that's something really important for us, you know, from this experience was to understand that that still is a, that is still a limitation. Larry, do you want to come? Yeah, so um, I, I, I think one of the uh, key lessons as we, as we just spoke about, uh, you know, was this kind of divergence, right, between the uh, amount of imaging available. Um, to put imaging on the cloud now and to have that readily available, you know, is literally a mouse click and it costs nothing. Um, I, I, I do think that, you know, um, while it's true that um, the actual resist may not be available um, you know, from those images, actually there is a lot of information that is available and um, you know, we just have to think about slightly different endpoints. Um, you know, the time interval isn't um, you know, the same in clinical assessment. I would say that's the biggest one, but there are techniques such as modeling which are time independent or actually using time as a variable, in fact, may actually give us much more information. So, um, you know, to me, one of the take-home lessons of this is, you know, let's let's make sure, you know, we have some place to aggregate these images that you know patients were radiated with that are available. Um, that you know, quite frankly, now we don't necessarily need radiologists anymore. Uh, to look at them. We could have AI. I'll be on the beach. <laughs> I'll be on the beach somewhere. I can't wait. Um, or, 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 or rather, maybe I could look at a whole phase three trial in an afternoon, you know, with, with, you know, with, with the computer uh, together. I, I say that not jokingly, actually. Um, I think we're really at the cusp of that. Um, so I think that from my perspective, you know, from the, from the carpenter with the hammer, you know, the hammer being the CT scanner, I think, you know, that's really, you know, one of the lessons here. Um, yes, we need that imaging available, but then we also need other metrics from it that would be reasonable in the real world, and I think there's availability of that, too. Any other, other comments? I, I would just say that our group is hot on the pursuit of images. Uh, it may not be regulatory grade, uh, but I think uh, the value of images are, with all the problems that Diana you described, the cadence, the different scans. But if we can get our hands on the images, I know we can get radiologists or maybe AI to help us look at those, uh, you know, look at the tumors, look to see if they have measurable disease and follow them. Uh, I think of uh, the rare situation, you know, mutated HER2 and non-small cell lung cancer, you know, one to two percent. And you look at the data and it's all single arm. And what do, how do these patients actually do? And if I'm gonna think of doing this in a regulatory way, I need images, and even with all the caveats. So uh, I, I would think it's something we, uh, in the real world evidence space we should pursue. Okay, so for my next question, I'm gonna uh, start with Larry and go to Yana and, and anybody else. So one of the interesting things, sort of unusual things I think about this pilot is how many 
uh, statisticians and data analysts were involved in the development, and then we actually, as uh, biostatisticians and analysts, had our own separate sub-meetings because, no offense, we realized we wouldn't really get done what we could get done <laughs> in the larger meetings, so we had to have our little spin-off meetings that, where we met regularly. Um, but it was really important to, I think, have all those voices there from different perspectives, different um, perspectives of the way that they deal with data and different backgrounds in terms of the kind of training that these uh, different analysts, informaticists, and statisticians were coming from. So, um, so what were some of the challenges that we encountered uh, when designing the statistical analysis plan for measuring real world, world response um, to account for the variability in real world data sources? So Larry, do you want to start? Yeah, uh, you know, again, I mean, you know, to the point that was, you know, made earlier, uh, to my mind, a big point was what's the difference between the dictated radiology report and what's actually, you know, on the image? Um, is the radiologist more what they're interpreting in the report? Is that compared to baseline? Is that compared to the most recent prior? Um, is it an unscheduled event? Um, you know, the timing of the event as well? And really, how will that play into the, endpoint. Um, you know, I'll jump ahead. There's a lot of variability here in this, and we certainly saw, um, you know, that the response rate, the percentage of patients who were quote unquote responding was larger. The, you know, the question really is, you know, how meaningful is that relative to potentially other measures that may have other sources of noise? Yana? Yes. I mean, one of the sort of classical issues is that, you know, uh, patients were measured at different time points, and so how do we deal with that? How do we methodologically deal with that where we know we know we potentially have missing data? So that was something, and that was really important to evaluate in these spin-off sessions, uh, which is, and why it's important to, what was to have these voices of both, you know, epi and analytics and data science and all those folks participating. Um, there was a, I think it was another thing you were going to mention. Yeah. So the other, the other thing we spent a lot of time talking about was how do we define who is an evaluable patient mm -hmm. and how do we bring that into the, part of the, it's the analysis plan, but it's actually yeah. the sort of the broader protocol. And we had a lot of discussions about how much data we would need to have for someone to be considered evaluable, recognizing that the higher you set that bar, the more bias you potentially introduce in terms of the patients that you include in your... Um, well, well, you we, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, the w one part of this, because we did have a limited, um, I think you saw Brittany presented that um, each of the groups um, collect, you know, had, you know, had patients, but they sampled 200 out of, each, out of, out of their available patients. And the reason is because it was effort, right? Effort that we had to uh, figure out that, that all participants could do. But the, the, you know, what we had to get from that is that what if out of those 200 patients, we would have, you know, half of them only that had at least one response assessment. That would give us very little data and very little information. So we did have to, even though we knew we were gonna introduce the more research that you put on, as with clinical trial, you introduce more bias and select a population. We had to balance that. So we did have to uh, create some um, restrictions of, of patients having some follow-up time and some, you know, at least one response assessment. But however, we try to keep it to the to minimum possible, so it did represent the real world patient. I think that was critical, actually, especially for us. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, from the FDA in understanding what's available in this data, because certainly you wouldn't want to just take a random sample of 200 patients without any qualifications at all or any criteria at all. That wouldn't represent what this data could do. But we also didn't want the most idealistic scenario where we had full characterization of each patient at eight week intervals because that wouldn't necessarily be realistic for what this data may look like in the future either. So it was, there was a lot of discussion. I think it took several meetings of discussion. But I think we ended up in a great place that is not only um, very realistic with the data, but also gives us a very good understanding of the types of data that are available. And so one other thing I'll add is um, I, I was a strong voice in those meetings saying that we should do something to account for the interval censoring that is present with these variably spaced 
um, uh, assessments. And what I know, and I've, I've actually taught survival analysis, these are, it's very well characterized in, in survival analysis textbooks, but when it comes to implementing it, there's really not a whole lot of experience in the oncology space of actually using it. So I think we struggled a little bit to sort of figure out how do we incorporate that, because in, in oncology clinical trials, we don't usually worry about the fact that you know, if you have a progression um, in an interval, we don't account for the fact that it happens sometime between, you know, assessment A and assessment B. We always attribute it to when we see it, not when it probably happened. So I think that's something, we, I think we learned a lot about that, and um, I think we, um, I think we'll, we'll obviously have more to share about that as well. Um, okay, so for the next question, um, we did observe um, relative consistency across the real-world data, as, as Brittany showed us, um, assessing response by clinician assessment, despite there being some variability um, in the frequency of assessment. So what steps uh, can be taken to ensure that we have reliable and uh, high-quality real-world data for this uh, context? So I'll start with you, Pallavi, and then um, go to Nick for his comments. Sure. Um, <clears throat> This is a tough question. <laughs> it's a particularly tough question for someone who doesn't have the data themselves. <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, that one of the things that we've already talked about that I think would be great to have for each of these uh, groups, our real data groups, would be it would be wonderful if we could collect the images. Uh, it would only enhance the data. I, and I understand the limitation, and again, I completely agree. We're probably not going to get to resist, like, measure, or specifically resist measurements of response. But we may have something that's resist-like. And we are very flexible, I think, as a, a community, an oncology community, in understanding where very specific resist measurements of response are required versus where we need to think outside of the box a little. Um, I think that uh, also ensuring that we can find as much follow-up for the patients as possible within the data that's available as important with the appropriate linkages as available is also critical. Thank you. Nick? Yeah, I think uh, if, if depending on the situation, you may have actually a sizable sample that you can do some matching. So there's second line therapy in non-small cell lung cancer, uh, KRAS G12C. Uh, it's 12% of patients. Uh, there are oodles of patients out there uh, that are in the second line setting. And we could, beyond what was done here, is maybe uh, match patients not only by scan, but also by interval. And, you, and you, uh, images would be perfect. Uh, but in the absence of that, uh, you could get at least a closer approximation of what actually is happening. So, uh, you know, the other thing we did is, you know, we didn't, you know, we avoided bone-only patients. It, it's hard to assess those patients. They don't really have measurable diseases or are valuable. We, we, you know, we don't, we didn't look at patients that had brain-only when they had, you know, su some surgery or radiation since uh, they were not valuable. So I think uh, we can drill down a bit. Uh, the example I gave earlier about metastatic HER2, or excuse me, mutated HER2 metastatic disease, that's pretty uncommon. It probably is going to be uncommon to find those patients too. So, but I, I think, uh, I wouldn't give up right away. And I think there might be certain situations where you can find a match population and be able to do something. It may not be at, at the regulatory grade, but it could still be, provide some useful insights. Any other comments? Just one thing I'll add. I think we have to think about some of these questions, depending on what it is that we're, we're trying to answer in a totality of evidence approach. And while this is one piece of the evidence, there are other pieces of the evidence that aren't necessarily time dependent or aren't happening in the same schedule um, of events um, or schedule dependent, if you will. And so whenever we're thinking about these, especially if it's some sort of comparative framework or, or whatever the question is, if it's appropriate, thinking about totality of evidence is really important to get away from um, some of these that are just sort of insurmountable issues we might have with certain types of, of endpoints. Okay, so um, how, um, I mean, I'm gonna ask you this, being uh, in the thick of it and in, um, in, your, in your role, um, how are you considering incorporating measures of real world response to treatment um, in ongoing studies? Um, so I, I think that there are a lot of uses for this type of, of, 
of um, endpoint, particularly in the comparative space, right? So when you're comparing treatment A to treatment B to treatment C to treatment D, you are hopefully going to be using, having uh, the same limitations or the same biases across all the various arms. So you have to evaluate whether that makes sense or not, but if it does, then you may be able to use this type of endpoint and that type of framework. Um, comparing the uh, real world response, as we've mentioned sort of the entire time today, to clinical, you know, resist based response from clinical trials is probably not going to be the best um, approach for this type of data, but that doesn't mean that there's not um, a really uh, valuable sort of way to use it across, again, across the value chain, across looking at these sorts of things. Um, in the pharma space, we have to look at all kinds of, of different real world based endpoints because I think the oncology, particularly, oncology marketplace is changing so fast and the treatment landscape is changing so fast. So you don't always have, you might have literature based um, endpoints to set your go, no go criteria, or you may have you know, clinical trial based um, endpoints, but real world endpoints may be able to supplement that thinking or may be able to be incorporated somehow into your um, internal you know, go, no go framework um, in a way that makes a lot of sense. And so I think, again, engaging the entire value chain of different folks, whether it's you know, your translation groups, your clinical development groups, all of these, these different um, functions, if you will, internally that are using and thinking about real world data um, to start using this endpoint where it makes sense in those frameworks, I think will be really valuable moving forward. Any other comments from the panel thinking about using some of the endpoints that we looked at in the earlier pilots, time to treatment discontinuation, time to next treatment? Um, have you seen any movement in that space in ongoing studies, maybe prospective trials or, or, other, or other studies? Uh, not uh, so much speaking about our prior pilot endpoints, but certainly for this endpoint, for a real world response, uh, I think the post-marketing space is another very important area where these types of endpoints may be very, very helpful. Um, you know, pre-market is a very exciting space. I do understand that. But there's a lot of regulatory requirements in the post-marketing space, and uh, it would behoove us to look at those types of studies as well. Diversity studies, additional efficacy evidence or safety studies are all places where real world response may be a very helpful endpoint. You know, time to next treatment is a structured uh, data point. Uh, so you can look at thousands of patients. Well, most of us have that information. Struggle a little bit around orals, but, uh, but if it's IV, we can get those two endpoints and then we can say something. So correlating that with response, which requires opening a chart, looking at image, at the image reports. So that may give us a, some latitude in terms of getting a big picture post-marketing. Okay, great. So um, we have just a, we have a few more minutes, and then we'll open it up for um, audience questions. So I'm going to ask all of you the same question uh, for my last question, um, and and let's let's start down here with Amanda, and then we'll skip Pallavi, and we'll end <laughs> with the regulatory <laughs> perspective, um, so she can have we, the last word. Someone's being censored here. <laughs> <laughs> we run out of time. Who knows? Um, what do you see as the most uh, as important next steps to continue building evidence to support the use of real world data and evidence in regulatory decision making. So what is um, the most important next steps? Amanda. I, I think it's just using the data, using it more, not being afraid to ask questions, um, whether it's of your regulatory partners internally. Um, you know, there needs to be a lot more sort of integration and in the evidence generation framework within you know industry and i think it's happening right now i mean we're seeing that sort of evolution so to really advance this this thinking in this space there has to be that that coming together you know again across the various functions and thinking about what type of solutions that integrate some sort of real world data some sort of real world evidence may be possible and then uh, you know bringing the right folks to the table who have the expertise to to really inform that discussion in a way that it could be um, you know, could be taken to other stakeholders outside of the of industry to get that feedback would be a great next step. I think the other endpoints that clinicians use, uh, progression for survival, uh, is often, you know, what is really significant to the patient. It's uh, somewhat related to response, but having a better understanding. And then the famous OS, overall survival. Uh, you know, we looked at our own mortality data and we capture some, but not all, not enough actually. And we've 
try to uh, figure out how to how to address that. Uh, but that's such a key endpoint, and that's one endpoint that most of us agree. If we have good capture of OS, it probably is significant. So I, I agree with both of those, and just to add that other sources of data to look at um, as well and integrate. So yeah, I um, want to say, so I think as Pallavi said, um, and I think we all agree, is that we, we, uh, real world response is different. It, it's as important, but it is definitely different. And the reason, one of the reasons it's really important is because it's available probably for, or could be measured for hundreds and thousands of cancer patients versus the trial patients. Mm -hmm. So it's available. So, so what do we do for things that we don't quite understand or that are new? We, you know, we compare them to the things we already know. So we did that, some of that in this pilot. We compared the, this to overall survival. We know that endpoint. But it would be nice if we could start comparing it to, to you know, how does real response you know, compare to resist? And that's a difficult process because we do have to have images. We have a population with both images and you know, clini clinical assessments. But I think it's sort of the next step. So, I definitely think that the results of this pilot are very promising and certainly should be paid attention to for various types of regulatory submissions. And before I go there, I'll just say that I also think that this is really informative to the overall oncology community. You know, you're right, Yana, we have a lot of data that can inform how patients are doing on different drugs in the real world. And that doesn't necessarily have to only be used for regulatory submissions. I mean, this is important information that we have at our fingertips that we can summarize and tell patients, you know, this is how this drug actually performs in the real world. That being said, I know that the focus is generally on how can we use this to advance treatments uh, and drug development. And uh, I do think that there are a lot of spaces where, um, where real-world response can be used, especially in the post-marketing setting, potentially even in the pre-market setting. But I think we have to be right, asking the right questions for using this data. Obviously, we're not going to be looking at new molecular entities with real-world response rates. But when we're looking at drugs that are already developed and are, are out there, you know, what is it that we're looking at? How is this data helping us? Are we asking the right questions? That's all going to be context dependent, and I hope that we have the opportunities to speak with industry and drug developers on how we can use this data to enhance drug development and enhance uh, treatments getting to patients faster. Excellent. Thank you. So, so now um, we have the opportunity to open it up to questions from the audience. So um, if you're here in the room, um, there are microphones uh, near the front of the room, so I invite you to come forward, and if you would please um, say your name, your affiliation, um, uh, um, at, the, at the point of asking your question, and if you can, if you have a specific person you're interested in addressing, please uh, let them know before you ask the question. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Lamont. I'm a medical oncologist and health services researcher at Medidata AI. Thank you so much for doing this project and for the panel discussion. It was amazing. Um, I, uh, I loved that slide you had that described the response rates for each of the different uh, sources. I noticed that about 40% um, didn't have uh, a response, that response, real world response was missing. I wonder if you've looked at Kaplan-Meier curves to see how survival changes according to those categorizations. I'm just wondering about that 40%. That is it an indeterminate mix of people with good prognoses, bad prognoses, and the extent to which the real world ascertainment of response maps to survival? So, so just to clarify your question, are you, are you referring to the proportion of patients who could not be classified as responders or non-responders? Yes, do you have survival yes. information on them? We actually do have those curves. We, ha that, we love that slide, but it's a very busy slide okay. as it was. <laughs> so we, I think we were a little afraid of putting um, you know, another whole set of survival curves on there. But I think your intuition may be telling you that those, those survival curves, and Brittany is here and can correct me if I'm wrong, looked a lot like the non-responder curves. They were, they were short times to, um, to the, the other, the efficacy endpoint. Okay, so it was almost informative non-response. 
They, Correct. they died, yeah. The, the expectation might be that they did not come back for a formal clinical evaluation and they're, they're, they had been um, not having a, a, a good response to treatment. Sure, thank you. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that. We had the same question, and we actually did that work, and they do, you know, they look like non-responders. Okay. Mark Stewart, Friends of Cancer Research. Lots of questions, but I guess I could ask them at any point. But um, I guess one, looking at the figure about the clinician assessment, looks like images are a source for a lot of the information there. And so I guess I'm just curious, you know, what what is leading to the inaccessibility of the image itself? Because they exist somewhere. So is it a contractual issue between the data vendor and the health system, or is there some other kind of issues at play here? So we actually <laughs> looked at this. So we had 200 patients. Uh, about 20% were done at facilities that have radiology services in our network. And the other 70% plus were done uh, elsewhere. And there were about and Janet Esprito can keep me honest, about 70 different sites. So, uh, so for maybe each site did one or two patients. So a big network, the good news, it's big. The bad news, it's a big network with a lot of different services across the country. So when you're pulling and trying to get an image from one site, you have to have some sort of relationship to get those images in terms of PHI. So. Uh, I think it's something we're actually trying to address because uh, there is an opportunity. There's a program called Care Quality. It's a network where they where information is exchanged in a in a platform that is uh, HIPAA compliant, and our network has established that for getting uh, data records to our practices. And my understanding is that images, and Larry, you may know more about this, are will be available at some point. So there's there is the opportunity in the future to pull images and have them available. I, when I was in practice, certainly the hospital I worked with, I could get the images uh, and I could show them to the patient. So it, it the technology exists. It just it's all these different patients with all these different practices and all these different sources to pull it together. But I think it's I think it's doable. Uh, Larry, I'm yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Also, you know, there's technology where you don't actually have to pull the image anymore, right? You can a analyze the image, you know, right at the sp at the site where it was, and just you know, pull pull the data. Um, it's usually the baseline image which is missing, you know, because that's what brings the patient, you know, in for a different treatment, things like that. I, I think, you know, probably culturally, we're going to have much more exchange of data. Um, hospitals that are on Epic for instance, can actually exchange data. There are a whole bunch of um, exchanges uh, set up. You know, our, the, the file room of the past, <laughs> you know, is now basically, you know, somewhere in the cloud, and we're kind of just uh, disc jockeys and, uh, and, and, and na old Napster users. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, so I think it's, it will be, you know, uh, we will readily be able to get this type of data. Yeah, there's really sort of three potential issues, right? So one is care is spread around, right? So patients go to different places of care, they're not interconnected. And the solution there is pretty difficult because you have to interconnect them. So the systems are interconnected. So it's sort of a longer term process, right? There is uh, what we mentioned before was the contractual issues between sort of data vendors and, and um, you know, where those images are generated and stored. And the other one is sometimes there's technical issues or, or images just, you know, not extractable. There's others where data's onboarded. So those are three and some have honestly pretty easy solutions. So the technical things could be solved, obviously. Contractual things can be worked out. Some have very long-term and more difficult solutions where a healthcare system is not very integrated, as Nick was saying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you look at, uh, there are some still not as big as the United States, but European countries mm -hmm. that have actually solved this problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Great Britain, <laughs> Netherlands, it just isn't an issue. Okay, so um, you were first. Okay. Um, somewhat of a <coughs> speculative and more open-ended question. Yourself? Oh, uh, David Bowen, and I guess my affiliation is until Friday, I was a senior advisor at ARPA-H. 
Um, a more speculative and, and open-ended question, picking up on the point that uh, real-world data has valued patients even beyond uh, the, the confines of clinical trial. I'd be curious to know the panel's thoughts on how that data can get collected, curated for accuracy, um, disseminated to patients, and are there lessons from other countries that have done that really well that we should learn from? So I think those types of exercises are usually very academic. Um, usually where we see them happening and being disseminated, it's usually led by an academic group who creates partnerships with people who have the data and uh, then work through that to get a better understanding of patient experience or, or natural history with the data that's available. Um, I know at FDA we do facilitate <clears throat> some of these types of projects through our broad agency agreement, BAA grants, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't have the exact acronym down. Um, and sometimes we do see projects that really work through some of these issues. They're very academic, they're really enlightening, and can be disseminated. But um, it, generally, they're very academic-led. So I can make a plug for uh, University of Maryland. We have a relationship with them and the, something called the Patience Program. Uh, it's led by uh, Daniel Mullins, uh, and, it, and we've been collaborating with him and his group and bringing to focus, the, and I think, Amy, you mentioned this, is the patient's journey and sharing that journey with the patient. And uh, we did a recent uh, session where we looked at a bunch of, protocol, a bunch of proposals uh, that we have a program, and we actually brought a patient in to provide some guidance. But your question is a little different. How do we get that information back to the patient? How do we develop a relationship with the community uh, uh, so that uh, we can uh, have them not only hear the information, but have a sense of ownership. Uh, I think it's a very attractive but challenging approach. Uh, and we're getting our heads around, you know, how do we do that with real world evidence, observational studies, but I think there is, there is some value in, in approaching that. So thanks for bringing it up. Amy Abernathy, quick question, and this is not to make everybody groan, but here it goes. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious of what your thinking has been on the serial biopsy approach to evaluating real-world real tumor response as an endpoint um, at different moments in time. So what we're looking at is 200 charts from um, multiple different uh, companies up through 2018, and I, I think we've got multiple trajectories that are happening simultaneously. So one is that, you know, the, the documentation, what happens in the clinic, the available data in the clinic itself is gonna be changing across time. Um, our capabilities with respect to interoperability, impact of um, 21st century cures, et cetera, is gonna to continue to change, TEFCA gonna ch continue to change across time. Also, another thing that's going to be continuing to change across time is, for example, substitution of tumor response with other meaningful endpoints, CTDNA, other questions that, that may be happening. And it strikes me that this longitudinal journey of real-world tumor response may be its own marker for how the overall space is changing, because one of the key points you made, Yana, was that you were really looking at what were the components that would be available in order to do this work, and that the real world tumor response was reflective of the population much broader than would be in traditional clinical trials. And, and I wonder whether or not a, a documentation um, across time will teach us a lot about real world data and real world evidence capabilities as they come in and what we need to know. So I'm kind of curious how much you're groaning and whether, what your curiosity might be. I can make a few comments, but I welcome <laughs> others. I think um, it's a very interesting question. <clears throat> Certainly, CTDNA offers the opportunity for an objective measurement of a biomarker for a patient. And certainly, when we can move away from a subjective measurement, um, which unfortunately, disease response or disease assessments per radiologic images do have some level of subjectivity to them, uh, which is why in a single trial, you'll have multiple readers for a disease assessment and get different assessments for that patient. 
So that's certainly there. And if you can take that away and move towards an objective endpoint, an objective measurement of an endpoint, I think that's a wonderful thing. However, we're still, at least in the, I would say, regulatory realm, still not ready to say that we feel comfortable with what CTDNA actually measures for that patient. What does that biomarker actually represent? We're working on it. In fact, with Friends of Cancer, <laughs> uh, and there was a wonderful workshop this summer on it, and, and we're all in, in industry, in um, our lovely partner groups at the FDA, we're still working on that to understand it better. But I think you're right, there's multiple trajectories, and it'll be very interesting to see how each of them influence the others, and how important we feel you know, tumor measurement is in 10 years if we're able to establish ctDNA as a very meaningful endpoint, or change in ctDNA as a meaningful endpoint. It would be very interesting to see. God, I was, um, was going to say, so one thing, um, you know, us as, as data vendors, or, or those folks who, are, who have the data, <laughs> we're at the mercy of clinical care. So if in the clinical care we see a lot of liquid biopsy, then we can see it in our data. If, you know, a proportion of patients that get a liquid biopsy is, is you know, 5% or 10% in a disease, then that's what we see. And can we generalize it? I don't know. <laughs> you know, we need to see more of it. The other thing is, is um, you know, obviously it will grow. Like, the use of, of, of liquid biopsy will grow. It's also very different depending on the disease. So we're dealing here, th this project was on lung cancer, not small cell lung cancer specifically. Other tumors are going to be, be very different in what um, you know, is used for response. And the other thing is I was gonna say that we probably, you know, that Friends of Cancer Project and this Friends of Cancer Project can probably join forces <laughs> <laughs> to have liquid biopsy and we have real world response. We could probably compare those for the same patient. Yeah, and I'll add one more thing and then we have, um, we can take one more question, um, is one of the goals of this was really to show not to say regardless of endpoint, but with taking a challenging endpoint like real world response that has some subjectivity, what would happen if we looked at it in seven different data sources that all had different you know, ways that they were constructed from different sources and different limitations? And so what I would like to think is that we accomplished that to some extent, showing that we could come up with a protocol that could be implemented in these different places, unlike a clinical trial protocol, and still come up with something that had some similarity. So I think that was you know, a, a win, I think, as far as we all, we all think. So uh, last question. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the panel. Thank you, Brian, for the great session. Uh, my name is Kelly Liu, a medical oncologist from Marengo Therapeutics. A question about uh, immunotherapy. I think we talked about earlier about how we could use real-world uh, response for immunotherapy. Then one of the reason is because of the pseudo progression, that would be hard to assess. But I wonder that uh, if if we were going to do it, uh, what would it take to evaluate the real-world uh, re uh, response for immunotherapy? Thank you. Larry, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> so so look, you know, um, I, uh, well. The, the good news is that I think that clinicians could actually interpret it now fairly well, and also the rate, you know, of pseudoprogression in, in lung cancer with some of the other, you know, ther immunotherapies that are being used is much lower. You know, mm -hmm. I, I jokingly say, you know, when I show an image, uh, you know, of pseudoprogression, I said, you know, the, you know, the best person to evaluate these images are the oncologists, and they ask the patient how they feel, right, and they feel better. So, so, so it, it will at some point be a composite, you know, endpoint. Um, and I think that we'll be able to understand that, you know, quite well, both in real-world data by using diff varying data sources as well as in clinical trials uh, by, again, using various data sources. You know, I think one of the things we didn't bring up about immunotherapy that was different than um, the chemotherapy setting is the delayed response, right? So we, I think we also, one of the reasons we like the chemotherapy setting is that it, if you're going to have a response to therapy, it's going to usually come more quickly. So th that sort of delayed response for patients who might have not ha be lost to follow up before they get to a response, we avoided that as well. So that's another challenge that I think we thought of. We didn't, right. I don't think, share it. Uh, but, but, but keep but it there. simple. Keep it simple. Yeah, yeah. Like, exactly. That's why we kept it simple. Oh. For that other, for uh, not just another reason. You're going to say? Yeah, the, the, there the question is, is, is it's pro more likely probably a delayed resist response 
but there's probably, you know, in that period, right. some shrinkage and, and, and some benefit that the oncologist could tell as well. Great point. Okay, well, thank you, um, everyone, for your attention. Thank you so much to the panelists for an enlightening um, and spirited discussion. So I think uh, Jeff will come up and end the session for us. Thank you all. Uh, ho hopefully everyone found this extremely informative. I think having a case study that all of you enabled by providing your expertise, the data, and your time uh, to conduct was a, a very valuable case study. Um, please uh, stick around for lunch. Um, it will be outside in the foyer afterwards. Um, we will reconvene with uh, a discussion with FDA Commissioner Califf and a, an additional panel um, to dive into uh, some of the additional applications built on the pilot project as well as further thoughts around how real-world evidence could be utilized in the future of drug development. Um, for those of you that are watching at home, we will be reconvening in 30 minutes around 1.10 uh, for our lunch keynote session, but please join us out in the foyer. Thank you.
everyone, if everyone could please take their seats, we'll be getting here in about 30 seconds. Please take your seats. Good afternoon. I'm Ellen Siegel, Chair of Friends. Uh, really interesting first session and before we continue and I introduce someone who doesn't need an introduction uh, I do want us to remember it's 9-11 and just maybe a moment of silence or reflection um, we came together then and did some remarkable things and maybe on a smaller scale we can do this again, we're trying, because if we all don't, we're not going to have much uh, success, uh, particularly in helping uh, uh, patients. Uh, so real world evidence or real world data is not new to Rob Califf. He is, this has been his mantra for a really long time. He has lived in the real world and, <clears throat> and as far as I know, still lives in the real world. Um, and. Uh, and uh, as his second um, adventure at FDA, this is something that is front and center to him. Um, as you know, he's a renowned cardiologist who actually treated patients and worked on clinical trials, and this is something he knows a lot about. He's a tireless advocate for patients and for real patients and patients outside of the system and underserved and patients of great need. Um, we know his comments will be meaningful. Uh, Kate Rawson from a provision policy is going to um, uh, interview him. I assume Rob is going to do what he always does and be honest and perhaps say the unexpected. So uh, thank you so much for doing this and thank you for coming. Um, Ellen, thanks so much to you um, and to friends for, for inviting me to participate in this discussion. And Dr. Califf, it's always lovely to be on a stage with you, for sure. Um, so let's, um, we're going to jump right into this. Um, you know, we, we've heard a lot of really great discussion so far this morning on the use of real world evidence and real world data in oncology drug development. And so I think it's, it's a good opportunity for us to sort of take a step back. Um, and look at the issue from slightly higher up, and no one uh, better than the commissioner of, of FDA to do that with. So, Commissioner Califf, you know, evidence generation has been a big part of your work over the last many, many decades. Um, and I suspect it will be a central tenant of your legacy as FDA commissioner, um, especially this second, this second time around. So I thought we could start with um, actually quoting you from a publication in clinical trials from February. Um, and you wrote that it now is the time to fix the evidence generation system. Um, and you noted that while the pre-market system seemed to work um, reasonably well, in the post-marketing setting, the reality is, and I'll quote you, we have a disaggregated, fragmented system with a lack of organization around common, transparent, high quality information. So quite a statement. Um, so I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about some of the barriers that have caused this in the post-market system and are there opportunities for real world evidence and real world data to help? Well, a lot of places <coughs> I could start with that, but, but I think it may be, um, useful just to reiterate the first part of what you said, which the more that we've looked at it from the FDA perspective, of course, with absolutely no bias, we would say that this early phase, phase one, phase two, and for um, uncommon diseases or where you need small sample sizes, <coughs> phase three, the system works well. I mean, 
you know, over 85% of potential drugs that are introduced into phase one don't make it to market, so the system is weeding out ineffective or dangerous treatments. The rest go forward. I could give long lectures, and we have many discussions about the fact that it's too expensive and could always be improved, and that's an area of work. But if anyone wants to argue with me about the second part, I would love to have the discussion. I mean, the, after things get through the FDA, with over half the approvals now being accelerated, the system is a shambles. And you, said, you asked me what has created that, I would say it's reflective of the American healthcare system. You know, I'm headed to Singapore on Friday. And <laughs> Um, I helped start a medical school in Singapore, and you know Singapore has many imperfections, but astoundingly, one of their major national product projects is improving healthy longevity. Mm -hmm. Well, they're about to hit 85 years of life expectancy, and they're still increasing. We're at 76 and going down, so we're almost a decade shorter life expectancy in the U.S. than Singapore. And um, to make it even worse, if you say healthy life expectancy, they really are at a decade now advantage over us. And I think the main culprit in the U.S. Is, can't be that we're not spending enough money. We spend more than anyone. It's not a lack of technology. Everywhere I go, people agree the U.S. leads the world in innovation and creating new technologies. It's what we do after we get through the FDA and the way things are applied. And it's fair to argue, well, that's not just medical products. Of course, the social issues and social determinants are important. But it's, I think we're increasingly learning, trying to disentangle those completely is a futile exercise. And the societies where health and longevity are increasing are integrating more of those things much more effectively than we are. And central to that is the organization of information. Um, I'm also quoted as um, asking, why do I have to call Israel to figure out what to do with the next vaccine dose? Exactly. Why do I have to call the UK to figure out which treatments work for COVID? Well, the answer is because they have organized approaches to the information. In Israel, the three health systems have real-time electronic health record data. In the UK, there's a conviction that if you work for the NHS, now we could also talk about the many problems the NHS mm -hmm. is having now, but one thing I think they got right is the integration of clinical research into clinical practice, therefore real world evidence. So the fragmentation in the um, clinical research ecosystem, I think it's just a reflection of our health system overall. Mm -hmm. So then you ask the question, what can we do? You, you probably have other questions, but. Mm -hmm. That's okay, we keep going. going. Well, so what could we do to fix it? You know, you could argue it's just forget about it because you can't really fix it until the health system gets fixed, but we're gonna be waiting a long time for that. Um, and I, I would argue the health system in the U.S. is headed in the wrong direction. Um, at some point, we're gonna wake up and realize that integration of care is what matters, not each individual part sub-optimizing sub -optimizing its own finances. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the first article I read today coming out of the hatch was about um, private equity buying up cardiology practices. I'm a cardiologist, so um, this has happened a lot of other places. It's not necessarily that that's the wrong thing to do, but it signals what's happening is these practices then optimize their own well-being but a patient with heart disease, particularly older people, have multiple other problems, and we have a system which is almost designed purposely not to integrate. If you don't believe that, just talk to any friend or neighbor who's trying to get an appointment with a doctor of any kind mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. much less navigate between U.S. health systems. But what can we do in the research arena? I think we have a real opportunity to um, overcome some of this if but every part of the research ecosystem is gonna to have to give a little bit for that to happen. There are things that FDA can do. Uh, NIH um, has a lot of work to do there. CMS can be helpful. Um, and American healthcare systems. 
We all talk about patient-centeredness, but you ask me where the information is aggregated for the benefit of the patient. There's a lot of aggregation going on for the financial benefit of elements mm -hmm. of that system. Where is it integrated for the benefit of the patient? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't take that much give from every element of the system um, to get this in a much better place. So I was gonna say that you, you mentioned a number of different health agencies that have a role in this, and FDA specifically. So what, what can we do, knowing that we can't fix the big system now, what can we do in the, what can FDA do in the short term? Well, <clears throat> we're, so first of all, let me just say that we have a focus on this and there's a lot more to come. There's a Reagan Udall report we're waiting on that hopefully will give us more insight. But the things that are on the top of my mind First of all, it's really important that we again reiterate, we're not talking about the fundamental structure of um, drug and device approval. Mm -hmm. I think that works pretty well. We're talking about what happens after that, where FDA is only part of the system. But I think there's been a lot of confusion out there in the real world in two areas. One is, what are the requirements that the FDA has for the evidence? I see Amy sitting here, I know she got a lot of things started on that when she was at FDA, but if you go inside the FDA to the different review groups, you find different views of where that stands. So a lot of work to do there. But the second area that um, I think, having been on the outside in almost every sphere, I think is much more important than people who aren't in the business um, realize is the impact of the inspectorate at the FDA. And we're currently undergoing a major renovation of ORA, the mm -hmm. group that um, does the inspections. And th there's sort of a similar issue here to what I said about the early stages of, uh, I mean, the stages of drug and device approval. If you look at the portfolio of the inspectorate, 90 plus percent of their work is either manufacturing mm -hmm. or traditional clinical trials, where I think that goes extremely well. But when we get into this area, real world evidence, randomization in the real world, the inspectorate's not been mm -hmm. prepared to deal with that and it leads, to, uh, I think, the industry to be very cautious about taking a chance because if you get a bad inspection, it has a lot of implications whether you're a pharma industry or a device industry or a CRO mm -hmm. or an academic center. Um, you want to avoid those 483, you want to yeah. avoid those 483s. And so uh, we'll be working with the inspectorate uh, this year also as part of the, um, uh, the reorganization and, uh, of ORA to have a group of inspectors who are really focused on this area. Not just to say it's okay to do it, but actually to say we want people to do it when it's appropriate to do it. That's, that's um, fascinating, especially because sponsors, I think, in talking to them, really want FDA to lead on this, because they want to know. They want to know if they're going to do this, that it's going to be something that the agency will accept, um, that it's not going to cause a review delay. Um, so that's terrific. Um, you know, you, you've also said recently that there have been more than 200 cases where real-world evidence has helped um, inform FDA's regulatory decisions. I suspect a lot of those were probably in oncology. So looking ahead, how do you envision RWE continuing to be successful in that area and in incorporated into FDA's regulatory decision? You've already touched upon it, on it a little bit with the ORA reorg. Um, so sort of, you know, where is FDA coming from and, and where do you see this headed next? Well, to, from my perspective, um, there, I mean, there are a lot of places where real world evidence is adjunctive to traditional mm -hmm. clinical trials. And so I think that's a huge area that will just grow and grow and grow because real world evidence is gonna be there whether the FDA has anything to say about it or not. And it's kind of stupid to ignore high quality evidence that's out there. But the biggest area um, where I think it's gonna make a difference is this post-market phase where there are all kinds of mm -hmm. issues that often involve other parts of the ecosystem. 
do we really, you know, with more and more accelerated approvals, do we really know exactly who should get the treatment? We got cancer and rare disease, where often it's a highly segmented population, but now we got Alzheimer's and obesity, mm -hmm. where we got these enormous markets, or you could say, I think more appropriately, enormous human need. Um, and we know the drugs are safe and effective for the indications that were studied, mm -hmm. but there is a heck of a lot to be learned. I mean, should 65% of the U.S. population be treated with obesity drugs? I, I don't know. Um, we need to find out where the risks and benefits are actually distributed. And we're gonna have like 16 different obesity drugs as an example. Which ones are most effective for which people? We know very little about comparative effectiveness. Now there you begin to get out of the FDA's mm -hmm. swim lane and it gets into these other areas. But everyone here I know is aware that CMS has announced that real world evidence will be used in the IRA negotiations. So needless to say, CMS came to us and said, what do you think high quality real world evidence is? So let's, you know, in this baton handoff that I've talked about, let's make it smoother so that the right people get the right treatments. It's hard to argue we have a system now that's very good at getting the right treatments to the right people in the U.S. Who gets obesity drugs now? People like you and me, mm -hmm. <laughs> not the people that need them the most. Right. And, you know, that story is told over and over. Mm -hmm. It would be a good chance to fix it using evidence to guide us. Yeah. You know, you've talked often about the baton handoff, and I, it was mentioned uh, at the, um, the panel earlier that it would be, that there are maybe ways, or maybe Amy mentioned it, I can't remember now, that maybe there are ways for what FDA requires in the post-market and maybe what CMS would require for coverage with evidence development, for that to be the same and just for the two agencies, maybe instead of a baton handoff, or maybe it's the same thing, run alongside each other so that you're gathering, you know, a, a drug developer is gathering the same information for both agencies and that if you prospectively prepare and design that, um, that that might be possible. And I wonder what you think about that. Now, the way I would say it, so I'm almost 100% with you there, I'd say the data and the analytical methods should be the same. That is what's considered the most appropriate way to um, collect the data, whether it's from electronic health records, a monitored um, sensor mm -hmm. in the environment, or part of it in a special research clinic. There's a whole spectrum there. The analytical methods ought to be the best analytical methods applied to that. We shouldn't be doing observational treatment comparisons without a complete knowledge of what it takes to make a causal inference, and that would exclude 99% of studies done on COVID. Mm -hmm. So why do we waste all of our time publishing all those useless studies that couldn't have possibly answered the question? Um, but where the difference is, is um, the conclusion drawn from the data because we have different remits. The FDA, safe and effective for, for an indication. CMS is, all right, it's out there. Which part of, is it the whole population of mm -hmm. CMS or parts of the population where it's safe and effective and what are the risks and benefits distributed across that population? Mm. Um, talking about oncology specifically and understanding your and a cardiologist, and I don't know if Rick Pazder is in the room, but I know that, you know, you mentioned earlier, Dr. Califf, a lot of failures happening in, in phase one and two, and I think um, the Oncology Center for Excellence is, is really paying attention to dosing in those early phase one studies and really getting some randomized um, studies going with dosing to try to, as part of a move away from, from um, the maximal tolerated dose and get doses that really work for patients. And there was a workshop with ASCO that FDA had last week. And so I wonder if that's an opportunity just sort of came to me as we were chatting about how um, real world evidence or real world, real world data might be helpful in getting the dose right early in oncology trials. <laughs> it might be. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the sentinel moments in my career, I was the um, head of the coordinating center for one of the first monoclonal antibodies, which is REAPRO mm -hmm. for um, cardiovascular procedures. And we had this big panel meeting and I was actually the person defending our trial and it was going the wrong direction. It was really, really going badly because the clinical pharmacologist said, we don't know the right dose. Mm -hmm. 
And we could have done more dose ranging studies, but the dose that we used was effective in the clinical trials. So I'll never forget, Bob Temple stopped a meeting. He said, if anyone on the stage can name the right dose of any <laughs> cardiovascular drug, we'll entertain this line of yeah. reasoning. And there was like three minutes of silence. Mm -hmm. No one was willing, because there's always a refinement to be done on the dose. So I think the question of how much you can do pre-market, remembering that it's just really hard to show that any dose mm -hmm. is effective for any treatment. You call them failures, I call them successful identification of treatments that don't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's most of the game. Um, and you always have that nagging question though, when you, if, you, if you kill a program, mm -hmm. was it because we had the wrong dose? And often you don't really know. Yeah. But I think there's a huge opportunity in that early post-market phase People love, I can just tell you, I've done a lot of those trials in cardiology. People love to participate mm -hmm. because what you're saying is we've got an effective treatment. We're not 100% sure of the right dose. Let's compare mm. two doses and figure out which is best. And um, in my experience, clinicians and patients volunteer like crazy. You get answers quickly. No one's getting placebo. Mm. It has a lot of advantages. But of course, a lot of companies hate to do it because once you got that dose and marketing is in full gear, it's really hard to say, well, maybe we don't have the dose quite right. 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 So I, I think there's a lot in there of what, Pastor and I are closer together than we were in 2016. We used to have a monthly dinner where we just argued the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I think we're getting much closer together in how we think. That's great. Um, you know, you've already mentioned that there are other federal agencies like CMS that are um, interested in using real world evidence. Um, and I wonder if there are opportunities for multi-agency collaboration on big public health issues. I and mean, we've already seen this with Oncology Center of Excellence and the NCI um, collaboration on pragmatic trials in, in lung cancer. And I know you're a big fan of, of that. Um, but I wonder how RWE could be used um, to gain a better understanding of other big epidemiological questions, issues. Short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. All right, we got, you know, now we got Mandy Cohen at CDC. Um, you know, Rochelle was great. She did her time. Now Mandy's here. She's, you know, was chief medical officer at, uh, at CMS, and she understands the data aspects greatly. And if we just get our new NIH director, um, I can't say much about that, but mm -hmm. I'm very hopeful now that there's a hearing date. I think there's a real opportunity for federal agencies to collaborate. The thing, the headwind here is really something um, preparing for Singapore. By the way, I'm also going to India where there's a lot with the generic yeah. drug industry that we need to work on. It's very pertinent mm -hmm. to this oncology crowd. Um, it's just almost shocking to see the language of the Singaporean national strategy. Mm -hmm. We're already living to 85. We want people to be healthy for all you know, at least 84 of those 85 years. We're gonna do it by working together, mm -hmm. creating community systems that work uh, where we have a collaborative approach. Mm -hmm. I, I worry that the U.S. is headed the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. We're all rugged individuals. We can make our own decisions. We don't collaborate unless we're uh, absolutely at the end of the road mm -hmm. on other options. And I think we're paying a price for that. So I'm hopeful that we can develop cross-agency collaborations that really make a difference for yeah. people. What about, and I, and I was trying to tee you up to maybe talk a little bit about long COVID, because I know you were also a big fan of the UK recovery trial, and we have the recover trial here in the US that NIH is heading up. And I think you were trying to say, that maybe you were, had an idea that, that there might be an opportunity for, for cross-agency collaboration in, in long COVID and, and using real-world evidence? Well, I'd say there is a lot of cross-agency collaboration, but in the clinical trial arena especially, mm -hmm. um, you know, things have been slow. I think we all agree on that. There are a lot of potential reasons for that. And I know the, um, the, the uh, Admiral Levine and HHS is heading up the cross-agency effort. But what I can say is, we have candidate drugs. Uh, my next meeting, by the way, is with uh, long COVID mm -hmm. advocacy groups to hear their perspective. And 
Um, there's this view out there that you have to understand the mechanism of everything before you study it, mm -hmm. but I don't know, in my experience, oftentimes you're surprised by the way mechanisms work. If you can tell me why um, glyphs actually work for o obesity mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and reduce cardiovascular events, I mean, we know that the, there's a pathway involved, but you can apparently agonize it or antagonize it and get mm -hmm. the same result. It's hard to explain. So we've got to get the clinical trial system uh, going and take care of these people because they feel um, like they've been left out. They're forgotten, yeah. Absolutely. And we're all going through this COVID amnesia now where no one wants, seems to want to talk about it. Yeah. But these are millions of people right. and we need to do something. Um, external stakeholders, many in this room, in, including our host for today, are part of an important discussion, any discussion, on um, real world evidence. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how FDA is working with community stakeholders to set standards for real world, you know, d data quality, infrastructure, and methodologies. Wow, that's a, that's a big yeah. question. So, I mean, it's, it's well known that we're very focused on uh, patient-focused drug development. It's really product development of all types, and the, just as much in the device arena. And COVID is an example where the patient groups are developing standards that are going to be used in the clinical trials. Other patient groups should do that. But of course, the ecosystem, you got um, obviously multiple kinds of industry groups now um, working on this. And, you know, what we need are standards for things like endpoints, outcomes, which sounds like there was a good discussion about that mm -hmm. here. And I got a, I heard that it's hard to get the images. <laughs> now, this is not a technological problem, right? Because right. we're all sending images mm -hmm. back and forth all over the world. This is a human um, hang on to information because it gives me power and autonomy. Um, thinking that we need to fix. So um, I think we, I think, but I think things are in motion. So working across the different sectors in industry, in each field, there do need to be a set of standards that people can mm -hmm. gravitate to as they develop their systems and then bring those systems together. It's another place where Office of the National Coordinator mm -hmm. for Health Information Technology is important for the, for the basic clinical data. And I'm pretty encouraged by the effort that's being uh, made there. Mm -hmm. It's always been an interesting problem to me that um, we all tend to gravitate to our specialties, mm -hmm. but people have multiple problems at the same time. And so yeah. if you're a cancer patient and you got cardiovascular disease, you'd like those two to intersect. And so I think we need the specialty information, but we also need general mm -hmm. information that everyone should be able to use. Mm -hmm. Like your age and sex is not different depending on the disease right. that you have. Yeah. It struck me listening to the panel discussion, and you know, I know this was the third um, sort of pilot um, on on real world um, evidence in, in oncology that that Friends has organized. That you know, really the private uh, public private partnerships are a really, I think, useful way for regulators to sort of ask and and educate on what is needed um, in terms of endpoints, and then also at the same time sort of ease the minds of, of stakeholders and drug developers that might be worried about those standards. And so I just wonder what you think of, of that. Yeah, there's sort of a phrase in the statute that says, um, in the opinion of experts in the field, mm -hmm. is a part of it. And the uh, FDA doesn't know everything. We, um, sometimes people think that we think that way at the FDA, but in fact, um, I, I feel like I have a lot of experience with this, where you do convene the experts and the regulators um, and there's agreement, that's generally the way that things go. And so I think the public-private partnerships are absolutely critical to our working together. Um, all too often you actually find there's disagreement and that's when you need to mm -hmm. take time and have multiple sessions and generate more evidence about the evidence, mm -hmm. like different imaging standards would be an example, mm -hmm. where there's ultimately going to be a right answer that evolves, but you may not start out in the same place. So tremendous value yeah. where there really is agreement 
not just within the FDA, but in the outside world. Okay, great. Um, my clock isn't working, but I just got the high sign <laughs> that we are done. So, um, Dr. Caleb, thank you so much for taking the time, and, and uh, we really appreciate, as always, your insights in, in all of this. So, it's a pleasure. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate and uh, Dr. Califf. Thank you for uh, taking some time out of your schedule to join us today. We know it's busy and wish you safe travels uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, we are now going to uh, transition into our next session, the second session of the day, and our, our final one, uh, entitled Lesson, Lessons Learned from Real World Endpoint Analyses and Opportunities for Use in Drug Development. This session will lean on the real world response pilot as each, again, each of our panelists was uh, instrumental in developing the uh, pilot project that you've heard about earlier this morning. Uh, but also we are looking forward to hearing from them their insights toward fully capitalizing on the opportunities for using real world data. So I would invite them to uh, come on up and, uh, and grab a seat. Um, I hope everyone had the opportunity also to uh, take a look at the pre-read material that was put together by a terrific group of, of folks um, to lay out various considerations around the use of real-world data and drug development. Much of this will be discussed on our, uh, our session today. So I will turn things over and introduce our moderator for this session, uh, Irene Nunez, uh, who is the Vice President and Head of Regulatory Affairs at Flatiron. Get out of your way. So Yoshida sits here. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay, we're finding our chairs. First thing accomplished for today. It's great. Well, thank you, um, friends, for inviting us for session two, um, for all of our um, uh, invitations to, to share with you our thoughts on on, on participating um, on the various pilots over the five years. So first we'll go ahead and go and do introductions um, similar to the previous session. We'll have our discussion with some questions and then we'll turn it over to the audience for the audience's questions as well as to uh, online questions. So um, thanks Jeff for introducing me so you know who I am. So we have here to my left um, Ashita Batavia. Um, who is head of heme oncology data sciences at Janssen. We have Tom Brown, who's the chief medical officer at SIOPS. We have Laura Fernandez, who's the senior statistical director at CODA. We have our um, Jane Perlmutter, who's our patient advocate, and Donna Rivera, who's the associate director of pharma epidemiolo uh, epidemiology at OCE and leads the FDA's uh, oncology rural Evans program. So then to kick us off, um, perhaps we just start right from the beginning, which is uh, we've uh, participated in uh, for over about five years now on the various pilots uh, that Friends has conducted to characterize um, real world endpoints, to establish aligned methodologies. Um, and we heard some of those results today. So maybe just to start us off, Tom, um, we can tell us what are the, some of the top conclusions from our from our, from our studies? Well, as we've heard today from uh, many of the discussions, um, the first uh, important uh, result is showing the feasibility of collecting uh, real world data from varied uh, sources. And then uh, generally the um, directional alignment is a euphemism I would use. Uh, for the data elements uh, to include some of the derived data elements. I think it's clear that um, the uh, clinically based assessment of response is uh, easier to collect and report on than imaging. Um, it's interesting, uh, as Dr. Califf alluded to, on the one hand, everyone is talking about access to images, uh, whereas um, Probably the greatest challenge, is, because there are solutions to accessing images, as we all know, uh, the greatest challenge is how to account for the uh, real world idiosyncrasies of uh, imaging, uh, imaging data. And I think the last point is that uh, all of this underscores the importance of fit for purpose. Whenever one has a task in front of them uh, intending to leverage real world data, 
Uh, it's important to pay attention to whether the, a given data set is fit for the purpose at hand. Thanks, Tom. Any, anybody else with any further thoughts on that? Sure, I think I'd be happy to, to build on, on what Tom said. So, you know, I think it's been really interesting to watch the evolution of this process, starting with the first pilot, where we're really thinking about definitions and, and how do we all work together to, you know, what, what became at the, the previous meeting, you know, the, the frenemies panel, to, to now where we're here today uh, talking about what I, what I think is, and uh, you know, probably both requires the most development and probably presents the greatest opportunity, which is real world response. So thinking about how to do this uh, in, and capture it uh, reasonably and feasibly in real world data and, and has brought together a group to really think through uh, this process and answer these questions. I think about this question from a regulatory perspective and, and I think it's so important to, to, to think about how our top priority is ensuring drug safety and effectiveness and, and how that's backed by evidence. And so that's where this emphasis on data quality, this emphasis on really thinking through because there isn't randomization. And I feel like as an epidemiologist, I would be remiss if I didn't say that you know, we, ha we are, are thinking about how this data is subject to bias and confounding that could impact our estimation of efficacy. So, so aligning on these things, which I think we've done here, reduces the potential for variation from differences in implementation and differences in conduct uh, that, that might allow us to really avoid issues rendering studies to be uninterpretable because I think it's very important to analysis can't fix poor design, right? So I think the fact we came together, the fact we aligned, what we've really gained from that in this exchange of diverse perspectives, creating innovation, and what I take from, away from this study is three things. Uh, the first is in, in source standardization. So really thinking through the need for source standardization. I mean, I think it was impressive when you looked at the results, you heard about what Brittany mentioned, you heard about the discussions from both, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Abernathy and Dr. Califf just throughout the day. And, and it's, it's interesting because all the data sets had clinician assessments available for the majority of patients, right? They had the timing of the assessments. The timing was fairly consistent in these assessments. So if that's true, maybe there's an opportunity, an opportunity to think about standardization, how we capture this data to make it more rigorous, to ensure that it's fit for purpose, to take you know, this availability and translate it into to something useful. Design selection, really thinking through justification of design, and then methods validation. So how we make what we have generalizable. So, so how do we take the next step? Are we thinking about taking this information we've learned and moving into co-primary endpoints in a trial, right? Can we bridge real-world data and, and, and clinical trial data, pragmatic designs, creating this generalizability, this understanding of how things are done in routine practice to make it more generalizable for patients? Thanks, Donna. That was so much information in that response. Um, so we just have to, so much of what you said is really gonna permeate through all of our discussion today. Um, so, so one of the things you mentioned was the importance of aligning on methodology for these FAW pilots. And um, that was critically important for the success of the, pro of the projects. One of the things that was quite interesting, of course, was aligning between in methodology between different data sets or different um, data sources as opposed to um, comparing it to clinical trial endpoints. So Laura, I was hoping maybe how you can share with us your thinking around why is it, why is there a distinction, why was that important? Um, so for everyone who knows in this room, obviously real world data is something that is collected outside of a clinical trial protocol. And so by definition, real world data is different from clinical trials. You cannot have all the benefits of randomization, of controlling for bias, and all the other design features that you get in a randomized clinical trial. Having said that, we have clinical trials that are single arm in nature, where there is no randomization, and that are still subject to the same biases that we see in observational data. And so with that aspect, what we're trying to do in observational data is, or using real world data, is to try to conform it in some way to the same aspects that we would get in a, in a randomized clinical trial. So we have all these design limitations, but we're trying to make it similar to what we would have in a randomized clinical trial, even though randomized 
uh, clinical trial data was collected with a specific objective in place, whereas we all know real-world data is not collected with the same research objective in, in place. We have different objectives in collecting real-world data, and so we are using it, trying to massage it into making it look feasible to use in a clinical trial. And so that distinction is kind of very important uh, when we try to do these kind of exercises. So one of the things, that just to piggyback on, when we think about how to interface this with clinical trials is, and I'm looking over to Yashidi here um, for, for, for commenting on um, how, do we, how, do, how can we think about incorporating real world um, endpoints into clinical trial designs? That's a really good question. I think that there's a lot of work to be done with how we integrate these endpoints into our trials, but fundamentally, if we go back to the fact that Yes, clinical trials are designed in this extremely rigorous environment. We are very clear about the inclusion, the exclusion, and some extraordinary percentage of oncology patients would never be eligible for these trials. Yet, these are the patients that overwhelmingly, these trials aim to answer questions for them to make treatment, them and their providers to make treatment decisions. So how do we take this on balance? And I think there is a world where some of these, you know, clinical trial designs that we have, we can adapt with pragmatic elements as well. So if we were to take some of these endpoints, so real world response is a great endpoint. We've heard a lot of really good things about this one over the course of today. There is a different type of flexibility in how you assess real world response um, or how you assess response in the real world relative to in a trial. But when you're coming at it from the standpoint of the patient, and let's take a hematology example, for instance. With hematology and response, you have the IMWG criteria. You look at stringent clinical response, complete response, partial response, very good partial response. Now, if we were in the real world, there isn't the same emphasis on getting bone marrow biopsies that would enable you to ascertain for a given patient did they achieve stringent complete response, but you could get pretty close to understanding did they respond to the drug. And one could even argue that with the patient in front of you, do they really want to know if the cost of knowing if they got to stringent complete response is a bone marrow biopsy, this really painful test, it's not cheap, it's hard to schedule, maybe just knowing that I'm responding to my medications is good enough. So if we take the bulk of the real world data and you adapt some sort of flexible criteria against that, where you can say, hey, we feel with confidence that this proportion of patients are responding to this treatment and having a response. And we don't know, we can't necessarily parse out with the same degree of confidence the depth of that response, their best overall response, but we feel something is happening here and we've randomized now patients that we wouldn't otherwise include, and this is a supplement to reinforce that this works here, then that's pretty cool. And another area where I think these two different approaches, these different types of data can work well together is when we talk about diversity in our trials. This is a challenge that we have not managed to really figure out, not for lack of scratching our heads and trying everything we can, but in the real world, there are those minority patients. And if we're able to take that wealth of data and try to draw these conclusions to supplement how we do things and how we interpret our trial data, I think there's a powerful synergy here that's worth having a conversation over. Thanks, Yashida. Any other thoughts on that? Um, please go ahead, Jane. No, um, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Expanding it to make sure, um, you know, you, you, we often dis make a distinction uh, between efficacious drugs and effective drugs. Efficacious being the ones that get approval, and effective ones being how they're actually used. And real world, and to patients, uh, efficacious drug that's not effective is not of any value. So real world evidence can certainly establish the effectiveness, it can establish that it's effective in a bigger population. Um, th the other thing um, is that, um, y you know, patients really are usually not treated based uh, solely on imaging. They're based on, uh, I think, endpoints like time to next treatment or time to treatment discontinuation take into account other contextual impact. Uh, so for example, if a patient is having some toxicity, maybe tolerable, but still not so good. If there are other treatments available, 
a patient will switch more rapidly. If the patient is doing fine and there's a little progression but there's nothing else available, they'll stay on it longer. But those are things that we really need to know. Um, you know, I like to make a distinction between drug development and treatment optimization. And I think we're here trying to talk about drug development. But to patients, treatment optimization is what's really important. And that's where real world knowledge is even more important, in my opinion, than, um, than clinical trial data. Find out um, you know, how it works in the real world with people with ha who have um, all kinds of comorbidities, who are treated maybe at not academic centers, um, also learn about um, much more about the toxicities, um, learn about possibly real world evidence could be done to find out about the impact of sequencing, something that virtually no one ever does, but is really important or could be important. Um, there are rare cancers where um, the drugs are used uh, off label. Real world evidence could establish their usefulness. You know, um, the TAPER trial which actually it's, it was sort of initiated with some concepts that happened at a Friends of Cancer Research meeting. Um, and it's a, a great trial. I, I assume people know it's an ASCO trial that's um, all FDA approved drugs for off-label use, people who have the right biomarker. Um, it's great, but not every drug is available that way. Not every, uh, it has, I think, 250 sites now but not everyone can be in it. But real world data could be used um, to assess those kinds of treatments. So those are just some of the examples. Thank you, Jane. Tom, did you want to say something? Well, there's something that both Ashita and Jane have touched on that I think is so important. The concept of diversity when it comes to the real world, uh, yes, it's about underserved populations. Uh, it includes considerations with regard to race and ethnicity, but also with regard to age, uh, very young age and more advanced age, um, as well as comorbid conditions, which are incredibly important. Uh, and the other comment that I think derives from the excellent uh, comments that have been made so far is the power of leveraging real world data to design clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Because in most cases, when we encounter a clinical trial that's not accruing well, uh, or operationally is complicated, it has to do with the initial design. And I think increasingly those of us who are clinical trialists are finding that informing our designs early on at the very inception of putting the protocol together with real world experience is, is helpful. Thank you, Tom. One of the things that we've learned from um, our pilots is that we learned a lot about our data. And so some of those um, limitations of real world data, and I think we, we heard one of our previous uh, speakers talk about how um, your, your really reflects data that are being collected at the point of care by our physicians. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Donna and, as well as Laura on, on sort of the next question, which is um, some of the limitations were data missingness, the heterogeneity of frequency and the frequency of assessments, for instance, that we heard a lot about in the previous session. Um, what are some things that we can, we also heard that analysis from just a few seconds ago from Donna where uh, you can't overcome some limitations just by analyses. Um, what are, I'll start maybe perhaps with Donna, if, uh, what are your thoughts or recommendations for how to overcome these challenges? So I think, of course, this is a, a multifaceted and challenging question, but I think that the first thing uh, that, that, that seems most important and, and kind of right there is, is it has to be acknowledged, right? Transparency is key. So if there are limitations, they have to be stated up front. And then I think one of the, the things that, that we've seen is, is, is really a lack of, 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 under, of sitting and really thinking, wh what is the study question? What is the intended use? And then, you know, how might that be able to be used? And, and as you're asking that question and doing these upfront feasibility analysis, what is the quantification of the missingness? Because if it is too great, may, maybe this isn't the right data source, right? Maybe, so, so it's not exactly a way to overcome missingness, but it's a way to really think about how to mitigate so that you're not in, again, it's that design principle up front, right? Thinking about how you might design it up front, design your protocol SAP up front, but also something that was mentioned earlier and I've thought a lot about is, is what about the data type? So a lot of times 
real world data in the traditional con construct is thought of as retrospective. But what about opportunities for prospective data collection, right? Thinking about registries that can be designed with specific data elements collected upfront or pragmatic trials with pre-specified protocols where you're likely to be able to reduce that missingness and, and, it's, and of course, in data that's not necessarily collected for research purposes, more likely to be collected at the point of care. Though hopefully at one point that will change and clinical practice and clinical research will be more closely uh, aligned. But I think right now it's, you know, are there prospective opportunities and have you been able to look at it up front? And, and when you're doing that, things like um, the oncology cue card, ways to look at things up front, think about what the possibility is. And then the one other thing I'll mention is uh, auditing and inspection, which is something that will, will, I think, come to this point. So as you're thinking about what, what's there and how to overcome it, also thinking about what's needed. And I think that's why efforts like this are so useful for us to think about this. And, and, um, and I think our guidance that's been recently released is getting to a lot of these points, too, around our current thinking and as a community, how we can come together. So I think these efforts inform guidance and other efforts ongoing. And, um, and really help us to think about it as a scientific community and uh, work to, to overcome, and if not overcome, at least mitigate and, and appreciate the limitations. Laura? Yes, so missingness is such a big topic in clinical trials, and uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is missingness, the concept is very much defined in the context of a clinical trial where you expect a result to be present or a visit to be present as per a predefined schedule, as defined in a clinical trial protocol. But when you try to translate it in the real world setting, it is not really an appropriate term. When you say this data point is missing, what you mean by missing in real world setting? Uh, was the lab test ordered and the patient did not do the test? was the lab test ordered, the results came in, and somebody did not enter it into the EHR, or the lab test was ordered, the patient did it, and it was an unknown value. So it was undetectable. So, so you have three different kinds of missingness, for example, over here. And so defining it in the context of a real world setting uh, gives, rise to, gives rise to a framework of how to handle this. So uh, just blatantly saying that real world data gives rise to a lot of missingness, I think is a wrong characterization of real world data in general. Uh, the second aspect that I would touch upon is uh, uh, to what even Ashita was mentioning earlier. You might not do a particular test in the real world setting because that might be routine care. You might not want to do the bone biopsy because patients don't want to go through all that pain to uh, really differentiate between a stringent response and a complete response or a partial response. And uh, from the earlier session today, we saw lots of partial responses. Excuse me, but you better ask the patient, because some patients do. Yes, <laughs> some patients might want to know that, right? But for a physician, yeah. uh, a, a treating physician for routine care, it might just be like the doctor wants to know, yes, you're responding to treatment. Should I keep you on this treatment or change therapies? So maybe that is what you need in routine care. And like I said earlier, we are trying to conform real world practice to a clinical trial for what it was not really collected. And so we need to work with these limitations somehow. Um, as solutions, I can think of uh, three different approaches, uh, like a three-prong approach. Uh, as your first approach, you could consider uh, what exactly is the criticality of uh, your endpoint? Like what are the different things that are really important? Yes, you might want to have uh, your date of progression clearly documented, the start date of your treatment really, I mean those are important uh, details that you need in your real world. So that is a highly critical element. Applying your inclusion exclusion criteria, covariates, that might be the second most critical element. And maybe your covariates are not so important, uh, you know, the uh, how uh, uh, certain, certain baseline features. So, so having some kind of criticality in uh, the kind of information you need. Um, the second thing I would say is, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you have some kind of a mindful imputation uh, in the sense that, uh, in the sense that uh, a patient's ECOG score might be missing? 
uh, on a particular line of therapy, but then you know that particular patient has gone on to receive a highly intensive chemotherapy. And we know that to receive highly intensive chemotherapy, you need to be in a particular physical state. And so maybe you can assume that since this particular patient went on to receive something uh, that's highly intensive, uh, we can assume that uh, their ECOG score was maybe a zero or a one or less than two on that, on that per, uh, per, uh, current therapy. We've also applied a similar rule in our endpoints definitions uh, where uh, for time to the next treatment, we are trying to use that as a surrogate for uh, disease progression because uh, initiation of the next line of therapy definitely indicates that the patient uh, did not, for whatever reason, tolerate or respond to the current therapy and hence initiated the next line. So this mindful, thoughtful process of how you use your data, I think could help in definition of these real world endpoints and uh, in, in, in trying to translate them into the clinical trial setting. I wanted to add something. So I think a lot of the, the themes and the comments that have been made make a ton of sense. There is something to be said for retrospective real world data and the limitations inherent to it. And missingness is something that comes up often, right? As is the schedule of assessments, especially for time-based endpoints like progression-free survival, duration of response, and so forth. And there may be certain endpoints and certain use cases that are more amenable to going after in this passively collected data. This is somewhat separate as a bucket from this prospectively captured real world data where we start to drift towards pragmatic trials and an ability to really allow for more flexibility in study design, which I think is a lot of what, our, um, what Jane is talking about here as well, which is you know, meet the patients where they are, give the information that we need, be more inclusive. And I think that when you're moving from you know, the, the use cases, and if they're in a pre, if they're in a pre-approval setting with drugs that have not been on market, we don't have a lot of experience, those safety concerns are going to be front and center and then maybe certain of these types of data, certain of these trials, these prospective approaches may or may not, may be a, be a higher hurdle to get there. But if you think about the context of the drug or the combination or what you're trying to do and then look at all of the various data sources and the endpoints, I think it's it's a bit of a an art to how you put these things together to get the answers that you need. And this is what Tom was talking about in the beginning. It's your fit for purpose conversation. And one of the things that's always been striking to me, especially as we were going through, as I was going through the materials ahead of this meeting, was there was a lot of talk around OS. We talk about real world OS as a somewhat perhaps cleaner endpoint than the other of the real world endpoints. It's tough and there are instances where it makes a lot of sense, but there is this example that comes to mind for me where, you know, if you have two interventions and you're looking at them and trying to ascertain relative differences in OS, let's say in your comparator, patients aren't doing as well, hypothetically. If in the next line of therapy, they get moved onto your interventional regimen, that really muddies the water for how you interpret OS. So if you think about the standard of care, the practice patterns, what physicians are doing, integrate your community providers, look at the breadth of the data, it, it does become a bit circular. It, you use the real world data to inform your trial design. You look at your trial design and like try to set it up so that it best answers your question. And there's so much head scratching from beginning to end to get to an answer. And that's what we're all here trying to figure out together. Thanks, Yoshida. So one of the things you mentioned was actually meeting the patient where they are. Mm -hmm. um, and Jane, so I'm turning it over to you, and, and you also mentioned patients that perhaps are not in clinical trials, the underrepresented population. Share, share some more thoughts from your perspective on what that means and how ruled evidence could be, could be used to answer scientific questions or evidence needs for those particular patients. We heard a little bit about it already, right. but perhaps you can do a little bit more of a deeper dive on that. Right. The, the, there are really two pieces of that. There's a, a whole bunch of people, mo many, many people that are, are uh, diagnosed with cancer really want their experience to inform future patients, maybe their children. Um, and they're sort of 
amazed and surprised that that's not the way we learn. We learn from clinical trials. So they would love to participate in um, some kind of real world uh, data collection and um, registries might be a really good way. Um, Amy talked a lot about informed consent and I think that that's, you know, a, a, something that we should really think about. I would add that we should also think about how we give results back to p people that participate. But uh, something that I would like to raise that maybe is even more important, probably a third of our country doesn't even believe in science or in data collection or the FDA or anything else. So whether or not they're going to be comfortable giving their informed consent contributing, it's really pretty scary. That's something that we probably should put a little bit more thought into what we do about that, um, not to get political or anything. <laughs> I think you did get political. <laughs> so maybe we'll just pivot in another direction for a little bit then. <laughs> um, so, no right or left, just well, some direction. No, just pivoting, no directionality. Um, and so what if you think about, so we've been talking a lot about real world endpoints and I'm going to turn it over to, to Donna and to Tom here. Um, and I know a lot of our audiences from the pharmaceutical industry. And so as we think about the desire to move real world evidence forward, how to use these endpoints, the challenges with understanding how to interpret the endpoints, et cetera. Um, can you, I'll turn it over to Donna first maybe to, Give us some thoughts, if you don't mind, on how, what, what should we be thinking about for a successful use of real-world endpoints in oncology drug development? Sure. Thanks, Irene. So I think, I think ultimately, the, quali the quality of the underlying data is going to be the rate-limiting step, right? So quantity, quality, missingness, all the things we've been talking about, and ultimately how those impact the analysis of the outcomes. So, right, analysis can't fix poor quality data, right? Uh, but to me, it's, it's a little bit of a, what you said, the how, right? So how do we use these? T to me, that's, that's the how is the purpose, right? What's the purpose of the data? So if the goal is an adequate and well-controlled study to serve as substantial evidence, then I think that's slightly different than the goal being a research purpose or for use to fulfill a safety PMR, PMC, and you know, our regulations, which we are you know, bound by, see that slightly differently. So to me, I think what the purpose is certainly impacts the, the way in which the considerations would be applied. And, and I think that goes back to these concepts of, you know, can you, can you standardize at the source? Can you think about your design uh, selection? Can you think about methods validation? And ultimately, from a response endpoint, for example, if we're using response, you asked endpoints, but response, then I think there's, there's two real you know, our team has thought about this a lot. We think about it a lot. And I think we've come down to kind of two points when we're saying, when we look at real-world response, is it something we can trust? And I think those are accurate representations. So does the endpoint represent the true outcome? Is what we're seeing the true outcome? Or is there misclassification? Is there missingness? And, or is it overestimation, which I think we heard discussed a little bit earlier as well. And then two, is it attributable to another design issue? Is there another issue at play? Is there some other you know, systematic issue with the capture of the endpoint that would lead us to, to be concerned? And, and I think this is where there's, there's this kind of gap of how care is delivered versus what we can measure. So how do we build that trust based on the system we currently have where we have data that's collected in routine clinical practice and, and then what's traditionally measured in clinical trials? And, are we measuring what we think we are measuring? Because ultimately, again, it's about data integrity, ensuring the drug is safe and effective. I would just like to um, sort of elaborate a little bit on that. We w worry a lot about quality and things like that. But um, I'm an, I was an experimental psychologist by training. I studied psychometric type of data, which are even messier. Um, and w one of our real um, beliefs was you had to have convergence of evidence. And um, you know, for drug development, we have these very specific things about certain number of trials, it's very controlled. But especially using real world evidence and optimizing treatment, converging evidence. And I think we had a really nice example in the last um, panel mm -hmm. 
where I think Nick talked about um, more, the, the clinicians had more people um, had a response, but they had a smaller duration than maybe in the trial. Well, that's sort of converging, you could figure it out. So when you get sort of things that don't quite make sense, figuring it out is sort of, that's where you learn even more sometime. And the other thing is, um, I have to confess, not only am I a an experimental psychologist, but I'm a Bayesian. So it's not, you know, all or none. We keep adding, and in real world evidence, more than anything else, we just keep adding more and more evidence and becoming more and more confident. And, you know, the FDA approves or doesn't approve, although it has accelerated approval that sometime it, it does away with. But, um, you know, the truth of the matter is that in our heart, guts, the way people learn, I studied learning and memory, is really an Bayesian approach. So let's recognize that. I think, that's, I think that's right, though. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of some of the things we talk, you bring evidence together collectively, right? And then you try to, based on the foundation of the evidence, make those decisions. I think it's such a, such a good point in trying, we're, we're bridging the, you know, real world data is, is, is a way to think about bridging the efficacy effectiveness gap, right? Thinking about how things are actually done in the real world and I think really applicable to what you Which is not to underestimate the value of this type of pilot study and actually understanding um, you know, the different endpoints and um, get, getting convergence in different data sets and other things. I think, you know, it's really important work, but let's not get too caught up on it. It's, it's uh, iterative, isn't it? Um, the other thing I want to call out as uh, a clinical investigator, investigator, especially in oncology, is the reality is one of the important steps that the FDA has taken is its accelerated approval program. And that's particularly germane, as we all know, to the cancer realm. And, you know, years ago, and thankfully I think these times are past, there used to be this false choice debate about clinical trials or real world data. And I, th I think we're beyond that. Uh, Amy is nodding her head in affirmation. Uh, the, the point is that with accelerated approval, with the program success, the efficiency of that mechanism, especially with regard to oncolytics, it creates some very important roles for real world data, right? Uh, it's a fact that there are fewer, uh, relatively speaking, randomized controlled trials that are part of new drug applications. So there's a role for leveraging uh, real world data. And then as others have referenced today, uh, in the post-approval setting, the post-accelerated approval setting, there's still much to be discerned regarding safety, especially over the long run, uh, as well as expanded uh, off-label uh, opportunities. So th there's a, a terrific um, role for real-world data to play in conjunction with classical prospective clinical trials. The last item I, I want to comment on, and Jane, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I mean, the big frontier that everyone's been talking about for years now, um, patient-generated data, patient-reported outcomes, and both in the clinical trials world, the classical clinical trials world, and I would argue in the real-world data world, uh, that uh, we're, we're still not quite there in terms of leveraging uh, biometric data, but also leveraging patients' uh, self-assessment data, which is arguably uh, equally important. I'd love to comment on that. Um, for years and years, every time I was involved in planning a clinical trial, I'd say include patient-reported outcomes. I've sort of backed off on that a little bit because I have now discovered that there are hordes of patient-reported outcome data that are not analyzed. Mm -hmm. And I say, be very careful. Uh, you know, it's not so much, it, it is patient burden. You have to be, but there are ways to make sure you have the right amount of data and not overlapping data. But make sure that you have a um, analysis plan for those data. They can be very, very useful. The reason that they're so useful is it's not that patients always report higher toxicities than doctors do or vice versa. I, I have a very nice chart that shows you that there are some um, dimensions on which patients report higher than the doctors and just the reverse in others. So if it was always, you know, higher, they wouldn't be that important. But the uh, clinician data is not really accurate. So they're very important, but we must ensure that they get analyzed. Thank you. <laughs> it's one of my pet peeves. Well, thank you, Jane, and thank you, Tom. Um, so we're coming to an end to our panel discussion. So, um, we're at the point where we're thinking we're forward looking, thinking about what are some tangible next steps that we can um,
propose, perhaps, uh, that could further advance the use of real-world evidence for regulatory use? Should it be for substantial or supportive or uh, for PMCs and PMRs, for instance, as well? Um, we're going to do things a little bit uh, on a rapid fire, just because of uh, making sure that we have some time for questions still from the audience. Um, and we'll start with Yoshida, and we'll end with Donna, so that Donna has the last word. So again, some tangible next steps um, that you can think of. I think one of the areas that I'm particularly excited about is pragmatic trials and putting pragmatic elements into clinical trials and seeing where we can do that in programs that are intended for registration. So this is pre-approval regulatory decision making. I think that there's a lot of opportunities for early engagement with FDA and I think as more of those sort of engagements occur and more of these trials are designed and spun up that we'll all learn collectively together and be able to really generate some high quality real world data with more inclusive um, inclusion and exclusion criteria that will be informative for all of the healthcare providers out there and a broader swatch of our patients. So that, that's something I'm excited about coming next. Let me hand off to Tom. I second that. Uh, by the way, Ashita, I know it may elicit groans, but the area of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, is one that's gradually emerging uh, with great impact in uh, the, the real world data sphere. Uh, right now, many of us are using uh, AI machine learning at a very rudimentary level to uh, extract data that exists within unstructured forms and also to extract uh, derived data elements. So the perfect example would be evidence of progression or not. And as was referenced earlier today, uh, AI and ML can be used in interpreting images. I would uh, put forward not just radiologic images, but pathologic images uh, as well. I think moving forward into the future, the promise of AI, ML, and some of this is already being seen, is leveraging it to uh, ingest both uh, biologic and clinical data uh, to uh, establish prognosis and effectively to support decision support in terms of therapeutic selection, which is very much the, the holy grail of uh, precision medicine, precision oncology. And the last comment I would make, I have colleagues at the Institute for Systems Biology uh, who are very focused on imputing causality from big data sets, which is of course a much more uh, complex uh, subject. So I, I see in the future there's going to be a lot of patient-centric trials, and we can see that already happening. Uh, the FDA has been leading the way, especially the Oncology Center of Excellence, in uh, trying to have this whole diversity of clinical trials, uh, to have results that you see in clinical trials that are generalizable to the patients who are actually going to be using those drugs in the real-world setting. And they've been trying to do that by broadening the inclusion-exclusion criteria. That's another example. And the use of real-world data is another arena where I can see this patient centricity being in full effect. Uh, patients don't really want to participate in clinical trials where they are unlikely to receive the investigational drug. That's one of the reasons why they participate in clinical trials. And I think as clinical trial designers, uh, it, it's upon us to, to, to use our patient resource the most efficiently that we can instead of having them being randomized to the same control arm where you have the information. Yes, pragmatic trials have their benefits, but we have all this information that's already being collected. We do not want to randomize patients to another control arm the, yet another time. Uh, so I do see promise in, in benefiting our patients in the future through the use of real world data. And my second point I would say is not all real world data sources are created equal. Uh, there are, we saw in our previous uh, presentation that there are differences in how real world data sources uh, have access to quality images and uh, source data. And so it would be nice to have more work done in standardizing or harmonizing across different real world data sources. So. Um, that all these responses are great. Just following up on one of Laura's points, a really innovative trial that I'm involved in um, has started uh, offering patients who don't want to be in the trial for whatever reason, but who are um, eligible mm -hmm. to be in a real-world evidence 
group, mm -hmm. and that means you can reduce your control group, and we should do that in all of our trials. Um, but the unique um, next point that I'm going to make is that you should always involve advocates early and often. Um, you never know what they're going to say. Um, I try to be profound, but I'm often provocative or at least passionate. And, you know, advocates have other lives and bring other things, and they think about the patient, and um, there's no reason not to include them. I, I think this, this pilot didn't include advocates, but I really appreciate you inviting me to be on the panel. Um, but always do that. Well, we appreciate your passion. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, absolutely an important point to make. Provocative. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to start by saying, you know, I think something we've, we've seen and thought and heard a lot about is, is this concept in real data. You know, we know it's, it's complex. We know there's a lot going on. But, but I think at the same time, to be, to be cautiously optimistic, right, perfect cannot be the enemy of the good. And, and uh, we know studies have limitations. So, so I think it's, it's, it's knowing that and then moving forward anyways and figuring out what, what we can do together as a community. So I'm kind of going to build on what everyone has said here and, and say, uh, you know, that I, I think um, at least in OCE, we certainly try to bring the patient uh, in on, on many of our endeavors from the work we're doing in Project Equity, Project Silver, Project Pragmatica, trying to work on where I think real evidence can make an impact in both innovative designs, in enhancing health equity, uh, thinking about all of these, these things together. The second is in, in what was mentioned around AI, I think auto resist, some of the work going on in these areas to, to bring together how we can leverage technology to build better data. And, um, and then also, um, we have a lot of continued work going on in, in OCE around methods development with ver various collaborators. And I think um, collaborate with us is something I would say. You know, I think uh, the work we do together in the, in the scientific community, we are all informing each other, building, building better together. So I think that's something I really appreciate about the work that's done here, the work that we can do together. And, and I think to me, for this specific next steps of, of what we're doing here in, in the real world response, I think seeing that these clinical assessments were available, that they could be standardized, that's, that's, you know, is there a way to think about standardized data collection and integrating that into this a more integrated system of clinical research and clinical practice? So reducing the burden on patients, the burden on physicians with the idea of really streamlining our way to collect data in healthcare. And I think this is the foundation of a learning healthcare system, which I think m many are, are, are ho hopeful that there's this convergence within uh, cross federal agencies, within the, the community to, to build together uh, with, with all of the opportunity that exists. So I think this, this study demonstrates potential. I think there's still some degree of uncertainty, which we're hoping that we can continue to develop. And, uh, and I just want to to conclude by saying that the ability to pave ne next steps here, I I'd like to thank friends uh, for all the work they've done throughout all of these pilot projects for uh, the advancement of RWE and for patients. Well, thank you. We'll uh, all second that one. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for, for the great discussion today. And um, let's turn it over to our audience. Perhaps first start in the room if there are any questions. And then if you could come up to the mic with your name and affiliation, that would be great. I'll admit that I feel a little intimidated coming here, but since nobody else has the guts, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> name's Charles Baylog. I happen to be a community college student studying cellular biology. Now, the question about the off-label off uses, I haven't forbid, I love research. The more the merrier, glory, hallelujah, just avoid Nazi type of things, you know, cruel and unusual, you know, treatments and all that. But one, but the off-treatment uses is what, uh, when they use off-label, what um, sort of protection is there for the manufacturer if things go wrong? The biggest one I can think of is Vox. My gosh, my sister would love dearly to get a hold of that stuff, but she can't get it because a bunch of lawyers got rich suing them over it. So what, what uh, 
So for the off-label uses, what protection is there for the manufacturers of these products? You, you know, um, when a, a drug is, um, really makes sense to a doctor for some reason, they can often, sometimes the insurance company would even pay, but if not, they can go to the manufacturer and patient, manufacturers have patient assistance programs. And they won't approve the use of the drug um, for a patient re who really is unlikely to benefit from it or if they don't have enough safety data. But if there's a good chance that the patient might benefit or they already know it's quite safe based on other uses of it, they often will approve it and they will pay for it. And not only that, when they do that, uh, I actually benefited from this many years ago. When they do that, you don't even have a copay. <laughs> well, it's just like the Vioxx example. I think the only reason, way they should have been able to be sued is if they either sold contaminated stuff or if they sold stuff that was not the dosage it was supposed to be. Other than that, I thought they should have gotten some sort of protection instead, like I said, people could really use that stuff, cannot get a hold of it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar I, with that. I, I one time talked to a lawyer for, uh, for the drug company. He was basically doing some pro bono work and doing other yeah, stuff. I, I'm talking about, you know, cancer patients who don't have other options, and there's a drug that is shown to be effective in some cancers. It's pr been proven to yes, be safe or used. something, and there's some reason to believe that it might be useful in that patient. Well, like I said, um, I just so worry about that. So I, I, I don't really know what you're referring to. Well, like I said, I'm the only one who had enough guts to come here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Simpson from Wujin um, Regulatory Affairs, and this question is for um, Dr. Rivera. Um, you know, I, I think that the Project Pragmatica is a really a great step forward. But I was just wondering if sponsors are embracing it in, in the same way. You know, sponsors can be kind of reticent to think that, oh, if I include patients with brain meds, if I, if I include these patients who may perform not as well, then I may jeopardize my approval. So do you find that actually sponsors are embracing those kind of elements in, um, during clinical development? So Thank it, you. Yeah, of course. Uh, no, I think it's an interesting. I'd almost turn the question back to the sponsors in the room about what what their, you know, kind of potential concerns would be with that. I certainly think all of our guidance and, and whether it's Project Pragmatica or it's our official, you know, FDA guidance has been really trying to promote this idea of reducing burden and, and streamlining efficiency, but also coming to talk to us early and often, right? So so I think the, the probably the best part of, of that is is when talking to us, thinking about, you know, if, if there is a perceived regulatory risk, that's where it would be discussed, right? That's the forum to come forward and, and we will sit down and, and try to figure out what, what appreciable and reasonable solutions are. As you know, Pra uh, Pragmatica Lung was launched, right? Uh, and I think that's um, uh, by NCI recently. So I, I do think we're in the beginning. It's the early stages, right, of, of um, the, what is hopefully the, the future of, of streamlined and um, efficient clinical designs. And, and uh, I would really just encourage the, the group, if, if this is something you're thinking about, or even as we talked about today, if there's something where you're thinking about a novel or in, in innovative endpoint, and you want to combine that with a clinical trial, right? It's, it's also hybrid designs. There's a lot of opportunities to, you know, come talk to us. We'll get with the, regula the relevant review division and, and talk to our regulatory groups and, and, uh, and, and work, yeah, work, work on any questions you'd have. And, and Don, I would, I would emphasize that this is really an aspect of leveraging real world data to inform uh, inclusion exclusion criteria and mm -hmm. protocols. Um, it can be an evidence-based approach in that context, right? Absolutely, and there are mechanisms, too, to, to come talk to us if it's not specifically in reference to an IND or specific medical product, if you're talking about more broadly, other mechanisms informing design, patient selection, things that you're thinking about. You know, I think we're, we're fairly accessible, and, and feel free to, to reach out to us. We would be, I think, um, of, of course, our goal is, is patient-centric patient drug development, so uh, if, if that's something that that is a question that you may have, we would be happy to, to work with you. 
also say sponsors are looking very closely and watching what's happening with Pragmatica Lung. And I think that it's certainly something that I'm very curious about. And I know that enrollment, I think last patient enrolled is end of 25. So it's a 700 patients that you're looking to be enrolled. So I think understanding enrollment velocity, what the patients that you do ultimately enroll look like and their characteristics, I'm definitely intrigued. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. This is coming into an end to our session, um, session number two. We really look forward to the new horizons of rural evidence and the flexibility that um, the FDA has certainly demonstrated and articulated. Um, and so thanks again for the panelists today. And we turn it over to Jeff. Great. Thank you, Irene. And uh, thank you, everyone uh, on the panel for joining the meeting today. Um, as we do wrap up the discussion, I truly want to very much thank all of our project partners. Uh, as I hope you could tell from the presentations today, a great deal of work has gone into each of these pilots, including the one uh, with results presented today, and, and we are very grateful for the efforts, the time, and the expertise that everyone has been willing to share with us over the last couple of months in order to complete them. I hope that these pilots um, are able to identify opportunities where real-world evidence can be applied um, in areas where we'll be able to focus our efforts into the future in thinking about uh, optimizing metrics and, da and data characteristics in order to build on progress for research to come. The work isn't easy, um, and I want to recognize everyone in the room for uh, spending the day with us, um, both here and virtually, um, and we very much appreciate your commitment to these collaborative initiatives. Uh, before I let everyone go, I do want to let you know that we have two exciting upcoming public meetings this fall that we encourage you to attend. Um, the first, Dr. Brown alluded to that very nicely, um, on, on Tuesday, September 26th, we'll have an all virtual meeting, so don't show up here, it's all online. Uh, it's the first discussion of a relatively new project for Friends of Cancer Research entitled Future in Focus, Digital Pathology and Oncology Drug Development. And then uh, we will follow that by our annual meeting, which will be hybrid. Do show up here if you'd like to join us on Tuesday, November 14th. Um, there was some overlap with some of the topics that were addressed today, so I think we'll have some very exciting sessions um, during that, that meeting, and we hope that you'll be able to join us. Um, until then, I hope everyone has a wonderful week, and on behalf of all of us at Friends, thank you for joining us today.